Hi, I'm Steve Thompson, President of Emory Thompson Machinery, and welcome to our June class uh, 2015 of Make It Fresh. This is Tie-Dye Jeff from uh, Mystic Ices and Creams in uh, Fruit Loop, Florida. And uh, Jeff, Jeff runs a fantastic, uh, it's actually Fruitland if you're looking for it on a map, but that won't help you either. Uh, a fantastic uh, ice cream parlor if you're ever through the uh, Tampa, Ocala area. It's, it's terrific to stop in. And uh, we don't really have a huge script, but we are going to try to make some different things today to uh, show you new techniques and any questions that come up, we'll try to answer them. And uh, I guess I'll go first, unless you'd like to say good morning and anything Good morning. Uh, for the people watching at home, there's about, what are the 2,500 people here this morning? No. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. <laughs> it is large, so if you want to attend one of these, there's room for you. We, uh, I wrote out the formulas for mine, and uh, we'll pass that around. I'm going to make a coconut uh, pineapple sorbet, um, reprising some of the flavors I've done in the past because they're so far buried back in some of the videos that... Uh, people haven't seen them, and they're, they're important flavors. They're, they're flavors that uh, sell well and people want to do. Um, so I'm going to use the CB350, which is our six-quart machine, and I'll start by sanitizing it. Since it's been sitting overnight, uh, since the last time I used it, theoretically, it had time to build up some bacteria, and um, I want to kill that off. So you use a sanitizer. I use uh, Sterachine. Uh, all the sanitizers are chlorine based. In fact, uh, if you uh, didn't have a sanitizer available, you could always take a cap, not a cup, but a little cap full of Clorox bleach to a gallon of water, and that acts as an excellent sanitizer. But you know, the health department likes to see this. They, they look at uh, a bottle of Clorox and they can't understand it. Uh, so having Sterachine around is really helpful. Actually, uh Okay. I forgot to tell you, Jeff and I agree on nothing. So you're going to hear two different, you're going to three, hear three different opinions from the two of us. Am I using this? Yeah. All right. Yes, you were going to say. Well, actually, uh, of course, I use the Emory Thompson machine and always have, and I use Clorox, uh, and the health department doesn't have a problem with it. It depends on your health department. New York City, they have a problem getting out of bed. The problem is you don't want to have Clorox. Hi, Butch. You don't want to have Clorox in your kitchen. That's what they have a problem with. Yep. You can't have any of your cleaning problems, <laughs> products, in your kitchen. And since most of us will have a small kitchen and lack of usable storage, we tend to put the cleaning products there because at the end of the day, we mop up and the mop sink is in the kitchen and so on and so forth. So uh, before they come, move the stuff out into another room because logistically and, and honestly, that's where it belongs. It doesn't infiltrate your product. It's in a sealed bottle, but it's one of the rules that you play by in this world. So you have to do it. Also, I want to sleep at night and uh, let's say this is a bottle of Clorox. Um, oh, are you going to harp and, on this? Yes, I am. Uh, it's a bo that's a bottle of Clorox, and that's a bottle of citric acid, which some people use to make, yeah, you're uh, make Italian ices more tart. <laughs> and you might make a mistake, and you might put Clorox into your citric acid, or at least you don't want to wake up at 2 in the morning and wonder, did I put the citric acid into the lemon ice, or did I put the Clorox bleach? So if you take the Clorox and take it out of the room or put it in a locked cabinet, You'll never have that problem. Or just don't use citric acid. Yes, which is the best way. Citric acid is what the old timers used to use, and it's a pretty nasty product. What it does is it makes things artificially tart. Now, make sure the gate's closed, and then I'm just going to pour this in. The knob is not tight. See, this is the thing that's fun about live TV. I didn't tighten any of these up this morning. You have your people do it. Yeah. Your peeps. Yes. Yeah, my peeps. But it ultimately comes down to me. So if you don't uh, tighten it up, it's going to leak. Up, lift up. Lift up. Thanks. So I'm going to set this. I'm only running the beater. I'm not running any refrigeration. There's just water in here. If I turn on the refrigeration, it's going to turn into a giant ice cube and lock up. 
So I'm going to put this on uh, homemade ice cream because that's going to give me my maximum speed. And health departments vary. They might say uh, run it for two minutes. Uh, you can run it for 30 seconds. Uh, I know that the second that solution hits the metal, everything is sanitized. It's not going to get any more sanitized running it for two minutes. But again, you have to work with your health department. So you do whatever they say. Now, when we make ice cream and ices today, uh, we're going to turn off the refrigeration. We're going to keep it spinning to push the product out of the machine. Uh, the product is thick and ready to come out. Thanks. And I, I, don't, I don't see out of this eye, so I never even saw him. And I um, knew that. He knew it. He, he sneaks up on me. Um, when you're doing just water, if I open this gate, I'm going to get it back because water is loose compared to, say, mint chip ice cream or lemon Italian ice. Uh, so I'm going to turn that off and drain it out. Now here comes the next health department conundrum. Uh, some health departments will say, don't rinse after this because now you're contaminating the machine with the water. And I, being a smart aleck from the Bronx, say, well, what do you think my, my Italian ice is made out of? It's made out of the same water. Personally, I like to rinse afterwards. What do you do, Jeff? I, I sanitize and rinse at the end of the day. And then uh, the next day, I'm ready to roll. And I do that because after meeting Steve, I walked over to his machine after he did what he just did. And I don't want that. Well, that's why I rinse the second time. I rinse this stuff out. And again, I told you, Jeff and I don't agree. Jeff's wrong. Uh, well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Yeah. Jeff's, Jeff makes great ice cream. Yeah. Steve makes great machines. Enough said. Right. Uh, except for the part that I'm a conservative and Jeff's a liberal. A hopeless liberal. Um, the, the problem with sanitizing at night and then starting the next morning is overnight... Oh, they just run, those little bacteria, they're running all over, zoom, right into the machine. Exactly right. And so overnight, you have bacteria that can grow. And I rinse in the morning, much as he's rinsing now. So you can draw a line down your, all your notepads today, and you can put S on one side and J on the other. And then when you go home, make we up We have your own four mind. hours and 51 minutes to go. <laughs> it's going to be a long day. <laughs> okay. So this is all sanitized. As long as I don't take the cover off or put my hands in here or anything like that, I don't have to sanitize again because I haven't broken the sterility of it. If we took an hour and a half for lunch, I would probably come back and re-sanitize. Uh, the barrel's very cold and it's probably not necessary, but always play safe in the food business. You think Grandma sanitized those wooden uh, ice cream making buckets before every use with uh, good old bleach? Yeah. Nah. No, the didn't. kids played with it with their little cars and trucks. Then she said, let me have that. And then she made ice cream. The difference is everybody is so conscious. Of uh, it. Well, they're so sanitary today with all, us using all these sanitizers. Really? This is what's causing uh, the peanut allergy is because this is I've talked to allergists the about peanut this. allergies are up here. No, they're not. Those kids are allergic. See, I told you he's very old fashioned and cantankerous, but he does make better ice cream than me, except for today. So uh, you've got my formula there, and I'll take a look at two. Did you see this? We're going to use three quarts of water. The boss. Just so you don't forget it. Uh huh. Sure. <laughs> I need three quarts of water. I'll so get it. All, all right, right. Thanks. And I'm going to need sugar. Uh, Twelve ounces of sugar. So I've got a nice scale over here. I'll use. You don't have to write these recipes down. He's giving them to you, and mine are in the book. Two of them are in the book. One isn't. But I'll give you that one. Maybe. Three quarts of water, right? Yes, you don't have to check. Three quarts of water. Now, if you have a larger machine, you just a uh, 12 quart, you just double the recipe. Okay. So I've got my water, my sugar. Sugar dissolves very nicely in cold water without any trouble at all. 
You don't have to buy any special shirter. What's that? More? Three fourths. Okay. That's it. Sugar and water, that's my basis for all Italian ice. I found that if you get up a little high as opposed to resting it here, uh, you're not going to spill. Unless you leave the cover knobs loose. Okay, now my next thing is going to be the Coco Lopez and the pineapple. Now, I bought, just because I was lazy at the store, Dole Pineapple Tidbits. Uh, you can buy, buy anything that is inexpensive because it's going into sugar water. It's certainly better than an extract. It's, it's real fruit. But you don't need to buy Dole brand. Down here in Florida, our supermarkets are called Publix. Up in New York, they're Finest or D'Agostino. You can buy the local store brand, and you're going to do just as well. Or as Jeff will tell you, he goes to the big the um, discount stores. I do stores. use the better brands. Do you? Why? Yeah. Well, because oh, you that's have an the can open. Yeah, somewhere. Or a screwdriver. Oh. You, why do you use the uh, fancier brand? Because uh, nine times out of ten, they're a little better quality. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn the infinite overrun control on. I'm going to set it for Italian ice. That sets my speed. And my spatulas. I'm trying to do this so that you and the camera can see it. This is the only machine in the world that you can do this. All the others will void your warranty if you could get it in in the first place. Their openings are so small that you can't put anything in. But their cylinders are so thin that they're afraid that you'll damage them, so you can't put stuff in directly like this. What's this water here for? Hmm? Yes. What's this for? Is that mm -hmm. sanitary water? Uh, I don't know. I would throw it out. It's a bitch getting old, ain't it? <laughs> it is. It really is. And there's no stopping the advent of time, is I there? thought it might be sanitary water to put the spatulas in, and you can go through that little speech. I didn't get that fancy, but you can. This is the part where we get ready to call the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> the emergency room. Are yeah. you, you going to do this, too? What's that? This uh, trifold. fold uh, capitalistic moneymaker? Oh, yes, we'll get to that. That's doing very well. Of course it is. Um, you said you were going to make me one. Got quiet. After already. I get my replacement book. Excuse me? You put the juice in the whole oh, I threw everything in. I want all the flavor. I want everything I get. This is Now, again, uh, this is Coco Lopez, which is about the most expensive you can buy. Uh, I find that other, it's generically called cream of coconut. Aha. Uh -huh. You're dealing with... Aha. Uh -huh. What? So you do use the top shelf when it calls for it. <laughs> no. Again, it was all I saw in the store. I was in a hurry. Um, I like the cream of coconut. It's just as easy. Now, the interesting thing about Italian ice versus ice cream. If I put all my ingredients in when we make ice cream later and you're going to taste it, you're going to say, you know, it's really good, but I think he should have added a little more flavor. The flavor in ice cream and gelatos blooms after about eight hours. It actually gets more intense. So you can't judge the product until after it's, it's had a little time in the uh, Sears freezer. The Italian ice is what you taste is what you get. So if you're experimenting with a flavor like we are today, um, I'm just looking for a cup, you can taste it and see if it's gonna be good before you run it. Now again, make sure you turn it off, otherwise it's going everywhere. And I'm just gonna see what this tastes like. Hmm. You want to try? Maybe I'll add a little more Coco Lopez. You got something? Yeah. Okay. I think it's a little weak. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. Now it's got enough pineapple. Though. Yeah. When you make a change, <laughs> don't be like me. Write it down and just say, okay, this is experimental batch number four, and write it down and do write what you did, because otherwise, you're going to come back tomorrow and you're going to say, oh, we made ten batches of that particular product, and one of them was great, but I can't remember what I put in, and then you got to start all over again. So write it down. And question. Mm -hmm. Well, let me address that. First, let me say this. Uh, there's a product better than the Coco Lopez for this particular dessert, and it's in my book. It's one of the secrets of great coconut in my book. Enough said. Um, the size. Um, you're going to determine that. If, every, if all of our ice cream stores use the same recipe book, what's going to make yours better? What makes mine better is that I like my flavors bolder, a little bit sweeter, and much more creamy than you can get anywhere else. So you're going to determine how much pineapple you put in. And to, for, for me to give you, or for us to give you, a piece of paper that says uh, 13 ounces of pineapple may not be what you like. And if you're all going to be successful in a frozen dessert business, you have to be 100% confident that what you're making is what you think is great. It's a classroom break. Okay. Continue. So you have to make sure that what you're making is what you believe in. You have to understand that this is the best ice cream in the world. It's not what's on the recipe cards because she can make that and you can make that. That's not going to do it. It's a guide. It's a starting point. It's a basis. If you think it's too sweet, back off a little because you have to believe in your product. One, one last thing. Let also, me get this going first okay. and then you can continue. We're going to uh, set it for Italian ice. Turn on the refrigeration. And now we're freezing. Uh, do you see one of my timers around anywhere? Yeah, there's two of them go. up here. I'm just going to set a general timer. I'm going to say, I want to check this again in about 12 or 13 minutes. Um, I don't put gadgets on the machine. The infinite overrun control is something I invented uh, 10 years ago. Maybe it's 12 years now. It's 12 years. And um, it's, it's no gadget. It's, it's the key to the machine to be able to make all these different products. And it's uh, something that nobody else has ever figured out how to do. Uh, but I, you'll see machines with timers on them. The problem with putting anything on the machine like a timer is, in order for this to meet Underwriters Laboratories and National Sanitation Foundation, this $6 timer would cost you about $230. And then when you put it on the machine and you tie it into the refrigeration system, when the uh, $6 timer breaks that costs $230, uh, it's going to take down the whole, mach whole machine. And if that happens on a Friday night and it's 4th of July weekend and you're not going to see a repair person until Saturday or Monday morning, that's a real problem. So by not putting it on the machine, you don't have this problem. When that $6 timer breaks, I throw it away and I buy another six dollar timer. So there's nothing on this machine that's, uh, that is just fluff. The other thing, speaking of fluff, that you'll see on uh, other Italian machines, which is every other machine, is they have a little hose here that comes out and goes, it comes to here and goes to here. You know, that's all nice and well, uh, but it's only cold water. And again, that piece cost about 230 bucks, and now you have to run a plumbing line to this machine to make that work. There's no plumbing lines to this. Um, also, it's only going to reach to here. It's not going to reach down here. Uh, so it's really pretty useless. And if you've ever dropped eggs, let's say, uh, on your kitchen floor and you go to clean it up, if you use cold water like coming out of that little hose, you'll be there all day. You need hot water to clean up a spill. So that little hose on there is, to me, absolutely useless. I could put it on my machines, but after 110 years of us building these, we just don't think it's necessary. It's fluff. Uh, the simpler you keep a machine, the more durable it's going to be. You were talking about uh, the product. I will get that later. Uh, how much of this stuff you put in here for me to do this machine? Um, for the stair machine, I'm going to put about a half a cup, a little bit like that. Okay. There you go. Any questions so far? 
Uh, Got to ask questions because we really look to fill about two hours, and this is a five-hour show. <laughs> yeah. So, so we rely on these questions. So please, any questions that come up. Please. Uh, Italian ice, it's, it's a great business. I, I absolutely love it. But uh, until I started making these videos, and, and the, the 119 now, it's going to be 124 hours of how-to videos, uh, you couldn't find out anything about Italian ice. Nobody would tell you. Everything was always the same answer. Oh, no, no, you can't make this. This recipe comes from my great-great-grandfather from Genoa, Italy, who brought it over to uh, uh, America and started the Italian ice business. Well, none of that's true. Uh, we basically started it back in 1905 with the advent of the first Emery Thompson batch freezer. I'm not Italian. I haven't been to Genoa, Italy, but I probably know more about Italian ices than anyone in the industry from a mechanical standpoint. Uh, Jeff has learned over the years, uh, like his ice cream, he makes excellent Italian ices. But there are different levels and different grades of Italian ice uh, as far as flavor content. And uh, Jeff would say, uh, always make your best, which is true, but at the same time, he's not dealing uh, with children uh, at all, uh, not in his business. So uh, in my, he'll say, you just don't have children coming in between 6 and 10. Sure we do. No, you don't. But he is an adult crowd, and his, his business is an adult business. But we have to deal with reality. Kids like uh, Superman Italian Ice. They like bubble gum. Uh, they like all these different odd flavors, cotton candy. Uh, we have virtually everything growing here in Florida, but we don't have cotton candy trees, and we don't have bubble gum trees. So there are three levels of flavor. The very best level... Are tree levels of flavor, you say? I tree? think so. You yes. don't have bubblegum trees? Well, tree. I get it. We get it. Uh, there's three levels of flavor, and I use all three in the Italian ice business. The very best is using uh, fresh or fresh frozen fruit. I usually use fresh frozen fruit that I buy at the supermarket, and you'll see that this afternoon. We're going to make a uh, red wine raspberry sorbet. Uh, the reason I use fresh, uh, fresh frozen is because blueberries have a very tight season. Up north, uh, they come out of Michigan and North Carolina in about late June till about mid-July, and that's it. Well, what if you want to make blueberry uh, Italian ice or blueberry ice cream in March or in November? Uh, it's hard to get blueberries. But if you buy the bags of frozen blueberries, they're sold in the supermarket in the ice cream section, about 12-ounce bags. And again, you can buy the, uh, the, the store brand and uh, you use that as your source of flavor, it's going to be excellent. Uh, a step down from that is using a base, which is a gallon jug of flavor. There are some flavors that it might be more convenient for your business. Uh, it's not going to be any cheaper, but a gallon jug of flavor, this one came from iRice Company, uh, which I think is the best in the industry uh, for bases. And this is a mango, and this is an excellent mango. Even uh, here in Florida, uh, at this time of year, it's difficult to get mango, and it's a lot of work to work with it. So a base fills that need in a lot of flavors. Root beer, uh, some people use it for cherry. Um, and then the third level is going to be your extracts. Now, an extract is, um, uh, you're familiar with extracts from the standpoint of vanilla. If you make a birthday cake, a, a vanilla birthday cake, you're using vanilla extract. Well, we can also buy bubblegum extract, or um, here's a coconut flavor. Uh, but you can buy different flavors, like the, 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 the bubblegum or the cotton candy, as an extract. So your formula is still sugar, water, and now a few ounces of extract. Uh, where I part ways with other companies is uh, these uh, often come you, uh, with a lot of dye in them. Red dye 40, yellow 17, uh, green 8. Uh, I don't possible. want these things in my flavors. People are smarter today than they People used to be. Doing this Nowadays, a mother with a, uh, um, a stroller comes into a store and sees a bright red product. She knows that's uh, red dye 40 in there. Uh, I want my ice cream to be pale pink. Uh, or if it's going to be uh, a cherry ice where I do want a real red flavor, I'm using fresh cherries. But there's also this company uh, called Green Mountain Flavors. And these are on my website. Uh, Green Mountain Flavors is making natural extracts uh, and natural colors. And I thought, how do you make a natural color? Well, the president of the company 
sent me a bottle of beet juice. You know, beets is in the vegetable. And I called him up because I'm, I, I'm always learning. And I said, who on earth am I going to sell beet Italian ice to? You know, it's, it's ridiculous. And he said, no, 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 you got it wrong. Beets are red, so beets make for a perfectly natural dye to use in your cherry ice. So I can get that bright red color, but I'm using beet juice instead of using uh, an artificial color. So that works out very well. So you will use all three levels of flavor uh, when you make Italian ice. Now I'm just checking on this. It's uh, turning a nice pure white color and it'll be ready to come out of here pretty soon. Uh, the higher the sugar content of a product, the longer it takes to freeze. So normally we freeze ice cream in about uh, eight minutes per batch, no matter what size Emery Thompson you've got. Jeff's ice creams take a little bit longer. Uh, his, his total sugar content is higher. It's a, uh, it's a sweeter ice cream than uh, what uh, I man used to manufacture. Uh, I like the taste of it. Uh, I also like uh, Bluebell, which is also on the sweet side. Um, let's see, Ben & Jerry is sweeter than haagen -Dazs. Uh, so it's, it's again, it it's, comes down to personal taste. But the higher the sugar content, the longer the freezing time. So when we get to Italian ice, again, backtracking, ice cream is mainly dairy. Italian ices are mainly sugar and water. So they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. So if ice cream is at eight minutes, Italian ice is gonna be at about 15 or 16 minutes. And, and that's, that's normal. So it's very uh, hot in that's here. why you have the, excuse me? Very hot in here. What's very high? It's very hot in here. It is? Very hot in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm told Two it's very hot Two people in the here. back just fainted. Wow, that's What's interesting. What's it, 84? Spend a little. It's down at 73. We'll take it down to 69. There we go. Spend, I'll and we'll, leave, and we'll leave the door open. Connie, we'll leave the door open. It's kind of warm in here. It's it surpassed I turned them all warm. down? Okay. Everybody, this is Sadie. Come here, Sadie. That's not Sadie. What's your name? <laughs> So you can't see, but Sadie's walking around. She has uh, free reign of the place. Uh, even though I set the timer, I go by look. So let me take a quick look at this. Uh, Jack, you want to zoom in here a little bit? Thanks, Slade. Okay, that's almost ready. Uh, and you can see that nice pure white color because uh, it doesn't have any artificial anything in there. No artificial nothing. So we'll let that go a little bit longer. Sadie, how you doing? Come here. Hi, sweetie. Hi. That's a good girl. You're going to do this now so I can get, uh, move this out of the way here? Or are you going to do me? it later? When are we going to do this? I oh, love this thing. Well, so I'm, a, I'm almost ready to take you it out. You should do it. So yeah. I will talk about it. How's my timer look? It says one minute. White. Okay, that's ready. I'm going to now turn off the refrigeration. I don't want it to get any colder, but I'm going to keep it spinning to push the product out. Uh, spatula, Jeff. In the water here. Now oh, you thanks. can tell them about that. All right. Watch how fast this comes out. Since there's no obstructions, we can get the product out very quickly, which is extremely important because we want the first product to weigh the same as the last product. When you've got a machine with restrictions, uh, then your product is going to vary. So we dump that whole thing in what, about uh, 25 seconds? Now you have and to then, eat this. Then we'll go on to the next flavor. Um, if, if, we were, if we were doing production today, we would start with lemon, then we'd go to orange, because orange is still a citric, uh, citrus, uh, but it's, it's uh, a darker color. It's going to be yellow. And there's so little left in the machine that I can keep going down to darker flavors. So I might go from lemon, several batches, to orange, several batches, down to cherry, uh, then grape, and then black raspberry. And then I would rinse the machine out. Okay, let's if I go. went from chocolate ice to lemon ice, I'd have to rinse the machine right away. But that's all that's, there is to it, and that's we all that's in there. We don't serve this. You come up and you take it. Yeah, so come on up and give this a try. The spoons are right there.
That's good. I'm always the most surprised when I taste it and it's good. <laughs> yes? Did you add the entire second can of cocoa? I did. Okay. Yeah, I added two cans. Two cans. Mm -hmm. Now, Italian ice has all the great buzzwords. It's uh, fat-free, cholesterol-free, sodium-free, oh, the way plates. I make it, all natural. I mean, it, it sounds like the, the world's greatest food besides beer. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to market it, is uh, all the good attributes of it. What's that? That's all right. Now this costs, uh, making it fresh like this, uh, about two cents at the very most, about two cents an ounce. So if that's a four ounce portion we gave you, that cost us eight Thank cents, uh -huh. and we're gonna sell that for a minimum of $1.50. So eight cent cost, $1.50, it's, it's a huge profit item. Up north, it's a seasonal product. It's May 1st to Columbus Day. And uh, down here in Florida, it's year-round because uh, when we're all putting on sweaters and uh, because it's a bitter 50 degrees out and wouldn't think of going in the water, all the uh, tourists come down and they're running around on the beach and uh, they want to act like it's summer. So they're eating hot dogs, they're having Italian ice, mojitos, margaritas, you know, everything associated with summer is what you do in the winter when you're on vacation. So this is a great year-round product here, but most of the country it's going to be uh, May 1st to Columbus Day. After Columbus Day, people get this strange uh, air about them. They say, you know, it, it could still be 75 degrees, and they say, uh, i got to go up in the attic and get my sweaters out. You know, winter's coming tomorrow. And so they stop eating summer foods. I already cleaned the scoop, you know. So I'm going to let Jeff take over, and uh, he hasn't told me what he's going to make. But Oh, yes, you had a question. Well, if I'm, uh, the question, we have to repeat the questions because the camera can't pick up your speaking. You asked, do I serve this right away or do I put it in a freezer? Since I'm here at 9 o'clock in the morning and I'm producing for the day or more likely for the weekend, I'm doing this in advance, I'm going to take it from here and put it into a Sears chest freezer and freeze it down to about zero. At, at zero, it's going to be hard as a rock, uh, but it will, uh, cold is a wonderful stabilizer. Uh, you can maintain it for a very long time, weeks, weeks on end uh, at zero degrees. And then Friday night, tomorrow's going to be a big, uh, big uh, Saturday's going to be a big day for selling. I take my zero degree product out of the uh, freezer and I move it into my serving cabinet, which is set at 16 degrees above zero, 16 above. That's the temperature I scoop at. And so I'm taking it out of there, the chest freezer tonight, putting it in here, it will gently warm up to 16 degrees to where I can serve it from here. And as the day goes on, by 11 o'clock, I've already gone through one tub of lemon ice. So I go, you know, I'm going to need uh, two more today. So I finish that tub. I bring the next one up that's down below and then take another one out of the freezer and start warming it up. So the business, the Italian ice business, is very weather dependent. You wake up at 6 in the morning or whenever you get up, and the first thing you do after you get your coffee is you look at what the weather is for today. If it's going to be rainy on Saturday, uh, well, maybe you're only going to pull one tub of lemon ice. If it's going to be sunny and 80, you pull three tubs. You, you always are constantly checking to see what the weather's going to be. Yes? So what's the temperature right now? Uh, that's about 18 degrees. Yeah, uh, coming out of the batteries is about 18 degrees. Question? Can you move it out at 16 degrees all the time? I could have it at 16 degrees in this freezer. Uh, all the time. Uh, all the time being defined as about three days. Uh, I didn't use any uh, stabilizers or emulsifiers in here. If I used stabilizers, and there's one on your sheet from a company called Main Street Ingredients in uh, um, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and they make a sorbet stabilizer, which is just guar gum, which is a gum, and carrageenan, which is a seaweed. So still all natural. If you put that in, you can keep it longer. But again, you become weather dependent. It would be a foolish business decision to take four tubs of lemon ice out on Friday when you know there's a hurricane coming up the East Coast. You're not going to sell any ice. Leave it in the freezer. If you go into an old-fashioned 
uh, pastry shop in Astoria, Queens, you'll see the, and you ask for a lemon ice, you'll see the server flip back the lid and then the server takes their spoon and they're going like this and then they're putting it in the cup and they're handing it to you. What the server is actually doing is, since I didn't use any chemicals, there's a little puddle of flavor forming in the center of the tub. And the server is just remixing that a little bit before they serve it to you. We don't use the visual display cabinets. Those are the ones at Baskin Robbins where you can see the product because without the chemicals, there will be this little uh, bit of flavor, which you can just easily remix with your spatula. But the public doesn't need to see that. These hold their temperature better. Ice cream, we scoop at about six degrees, and Italian ice is warmer. So that brings up another point. If you ever go into an ice cream parlor and you see Italian ice right next door to ice cream, run like hell, because that means there is, there are two different temperatures, 10 degrees apart. That means there are so many chemicals in the Italian ice to depress the temperature of the Italian ice that you don't want to eat it. You know, it's gonna, you're gonna be pickled for the next 400 years. Um, these cabinets cost less. Uh, there's three major manufacturers. There's uh, Nelson, which is top of the line. Uh, Global, this is a Nelson. This is about 17 years old. Uh, Global is uh, a new name for a company called Kelvinator, which is an excellent cabinet. And then uh, there's Masterbuilt. And uh, at my website, I don't sell, get involved in any of this, but there is a company called turnkeyparlor.com. That's T U R N. K-E-Y-P-A-R-L-O-R, turnkeyparlor.com, just like a turnkey business. Um, we sell direct to you. We don't feel that anybody knows our batch freezers better than anyone else, so we sell direct. All other manufacturers go through dealers. So you walk into a dealer, if you're in San Diego and you want to buy a cabinet, you can walk into a dealer, you hand them a check, and the cabinet is shipped from Arkansas. Uh, the dealer is just what I call a paper pusher. They're just taking your money and placing the order. So what I went looking for 10 years ago was the cheapest, most reliable, most honest paper pusher in the country. And that was turnkeyparlor.com. Their prices are good. Uh, their service is excellent. Uh, they're, they're good people to deal with. They won't oversell you. Uh, by overselling, I mean, and I'm sorry to take up all your time. By overselling, I mean, it used to be that you would buy something like this and it would say on there, uh, delivery and setup. Well, you got to pay for delivery, but setup might be $75. Here's setup. It came in a box. You lift the box off. You take the plug and you plug it in. I think for 75 bucks, you can take a cardboard box off and plug it in. So you don't need services like that in setting up your own business. I'm going to get out of the way and let Jeff talk. That was great. Ices. Anybody want ices? Okay, uh, the first thing we'll make that I'll make today is something that uh, I made from day one. I've been in business now uh, six years, and six years ago today, I sat way in the back where that bearded gentleman is sitting, and uh, I saw everything you're seeing, and uh, went home and knew that I could make better ice cream than the guy running the class. So that's what put me in the business. But anyway, let's get down to this. I'm going to make... Uh, when you make an ice cream, you have a few choices. You have a lot of choices. Uh, you can take, this is what we use as uh, the basis for our ice cream. Everybody uses this. It's basically cream. Uh, and if you want, to, your competition is going to be the soft serve guy down the street and the yogurt store down the street. And what they're going to do, if they want to make, say, uh, M&M ice cream, they're going to take a vanilla ice cream, and they're going to put M&Ms through it. Whether they put them through it in the beginning of the batch or the end of the batch, they're basically having vanilla ice cream with M&Ms on it. And if that's what you want to do, that's okay. I don't think it's going to be a, an attribute to your business, but uh, I don't do it that way. I thought when I first got into the business that the way to do this is to replicate flavors that we grew up with. We certainly all grew up with M&Ms. They're the single most popular candy in the history of candy. So if we want to make M&M ice cream that really is M&M ice cream rather than vanilla ice cream with M&Ms in it, we have to infuse. We have to start with this stuff here, which we'll take. I'm going to make, uh, this is in the book, so, uh, but for anybody else, we're going to start with five quarts of mix. You'll get mix delivered uh, wherever you are. 
because that's what you need to make ice cream and cream ice. And it comes in these bladders. Uh, these are 10 quarts, and you get two to a box, or a case as they call it. Uh, and you'll, you'll learn how to handle it probably better than I do. Uh, by the way, if you're a coffee drinker, add that to your coffee. It's very good. Uh, so, I brought this here for a reason. Uh, I guess I should have started with the other one, but to make great M&M ice cream, we want to infuse the cream with M&Ms. So the way to do that is to take your M&Ms frozen uh, and then put them in this handy little machine. This isn't just a blender. This is a Ninja. I, I really highly promote them. They're only a hundred bucks, and if you buy them uh, at a discount, you get them for 60, 70 bucks. When they break, you throw them out. Mine haven't broken yet. I have five of them, and they still, they're lasting years now. The, the thing that makes this machine different is this, and, and believe me, I don't make any money on this or anything, but it's the greatest invention in our business. It has three blade systems, six blades in it, so this really crushes stuff. And when you put frozen M&Ms in here, later on we're going to make uh, Milky Way ice cream, and I brought frozen Milky Ways. Uh, but last night I ground up the M&Ms, and this is what you get. You get M&M powder. A couple little pieces in there, but for the most part it's M&M powder. And that's what the Ninja does. So the recipe, um, it calls for five quarts of mix, five ounces of vanilla. Is that the uh, two fold of the <laughs> Glad you brought that up. I don't really care. I don't really care. Uh, if it, it doesn't really matter. Mexico, right? That's where I get my vanilla from. I use Mexican vanilla. You know what Google is? You know what Google is? We can get it in Mexico. Yeah, you can get it in Mexico. You can get it anywhere. Just go online and Google uh, ice cream mix. And wherever you are, you can get it delivered. When I first started, I had a, a six-quart machine. Uh, and I was making a little bit of ice cream when I first, first started. And I used to, I called up a place who delivers this because they all deliver it. And because I was so small and couldn't take a normal delivery, um, I had to, I, now picture this, I had a little sports car, a little BMW convertible, and now picture this, you're sitting on the side of the road, here comes a BMW, zip, stops on the side of the highway, the guy gets out, trunk opens up, a truck comes, the guy takes a box, looks around and throws it in the trunk, and I give him cash. <laughs> More than once, woo, woo, and it turned out it's ice cream mix because I couldn't get a delivery. I was only getting small quantities. So that's how I started, getting arrested every week uh, <laughs> with this. My, my, uh, I'll tell you, I make really good ice creams, uh, and you will too. Just, uh, just understand that you have to be, like I said, be true to your ice cream. It has to be what you believe in. Don't make what I believe in. I mean, if you do, you'll be successful. No, just kidding. Make what you believe in. Um, so what I do is I add an ounce of vanilla for every quart of mix. So we have five quarts of mix, five ounces of vanilla. In a lot of the ice creams, I scrape the beans also uh, for no other reason than to see those little flecks. You know, I think that's a, a good sign in ice cream to see those tiny little dots in your ice cream. Anyway, so we've got, uh, we've got five quarts of mix, five ounces of vanilla. Now, Steve, oh, damn it. <laughs> Go somewhere. I, I have the microphone on there. I can hear all oh, the okay. things you're saying. Uh, Steve makes a machine, and again, I don't make any money from the guy. Uh, his machines are his machines. He makes an amazing machine, and I've, I've been to the trade shows, and I've seen them all. Uh, normally, if he weren't standing there, I would take this and add it into the machine with this. 
but he's, he's a little funny about that. So what we'll do is we'll add it here. What about your extension cord? Yeah, I'm you need, waiting. You still need it. Yeah. All right. Uh, but anyway, you know what? Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to do it the way I do it. We need an extension cord. We'll have it in a couple seconds. No problem. I don't need it till Milky Way. I, I ground this last night. Okay. So, a uh, very simple recipe. Five quarts of mix, five ounces of vanilla into the machine. <clears throat> and uh, you can, unless you live abroad, uh, you can get this mix virtually anywhere. Uh, you're going to ask about making it yourself. It's, that's not what we're in business for. It's an arduous process. It's an expensive process. And it's, it's much, much easier just to buy it. And you can't do it better because these scientists have years and years of knowledge uh, with knowledge of things that you wouldn't think of. Do any of you know the difference in the fat content between a Holstein a Guernsey and a Jersey. I mean, I wouldn't know each cow if, I, if, it, if it ran over me. Or, or the fact that uh, butter fat levels change between winter and summer. If you're going to have a consistent product, you have to take all this into effect because the whole food business is about consistency. Jeff's product, no matter whether you go there once a year or once a week, it's always the same great product. That being said, uh, it does change. Uh, my product changes. But that's the nature of homemade. You may run out of, uh, for instance, dole pineapple. I make a pina colada ice cream. I may, I may not have dole pineapple on it. I may have to use Walmart pineapple. That's going to make a subtle change in the ice cream. Uh, the temperature in the summer, the ice cream is different than in the winter. But you don't have to worry about it. Uh, let life play itself out. You'll be fine. This is the ground up um, M&Ms. And we have. Uh, 32 ounces of M&M's, uh, ground up m and what? That's a lot? <laughs> Your jaw dropped like I just said, it's five pounds of m and it's, it's this much in a, in a half, a, this is a half a batch for me and it will be for you. you normally you'll, you'll efficient size by using a whole bladder as your basis for the batch. Anyway, so, so now, uh, instead of just pouring this in, I'm going to let the machine do the work. It's like a carpenter. We're going to let our tools do the work. So we're going to start this running. Uh, and this will run at uh, 234. Is that right? Home, uh, homemade ice cream? Yeah, 234. Or did you pick super premium? I picked super premium. Uh, 175, I think. No, I want it to be 234. Okay, just shut it down and go back to Can I just eight. go arrows up here? You can do that. Okay. Yeah, just keep pat tapping it. Okay, the maximum on this machine is 234. Uh, and 234 is what I use. So that's why I want to do it here. So you'll see. While it's running at 234, we're going to pour this in and let the machine mix it for us. Because this is virtually powder, it'll do a good job. M&Ms are what? What are M&Ms made of? Chocolate. They're chocolate with a little coating on the outside, which is also apparently chocolate. So I add a little more chocolate. M&Ms are milk chocolate. Uh, I add a little dark chocolate uh, in these mini chips. You don't have to, and that's why your ice cream is going to taste different than mine. I prefer to do it. I've done a lot of experimenting. I love to make ice cream. I really love it. I make ice cream every other day. I make about 30, 40 gallons every time I make ice cream, about 120 to 150 gallons a week, and I love doing it. The part that I don't like is not creating new flavors. So we're going to put this in also. And the beauty of these machines, especially when you're creating flavors, is dump it in. Just dump it in there. Uh, if you want chunks when your ice cream is out, like when it's served here, if you want chunks in the ice cream, that's another story. I don't. To me, I'm a purist. I want the ice cream to speak for itself. 
I don't want, uh, we don't even offer fudge or cherries or pineapple or, or nuts. We don't offer any of that in our store. We don't even sell cones. Uh, and I make a half a million dollars a year with a little ice cream product. But um, I choose not to have any Sundays. You may want that. I'm not open during the day. You may be open during the day. I'm retired. You may be working for a living. So it's all where you want to go. And if you want to sell Sundays, just understand that all that crap, all that stuff you put on top of the ice cream is going to mask the flavor of your ice cream. And you're going to become very proud of your ice cream. Your ice cream is going to taste amazing because you're starting with cream. And then you're adding foods that you grew up with and products that you know and tastes that you become familiar with. I have a question. Did you start freezing again? Not yet. I, I normally start right away, but I want this because we have the M&M powder. I really want a good saturation, an, an infusion. I like that word infusion because that's what we're doing. We're transforming cream into M&M cream. Okay, now we can start. So, ready? Yeah, okay. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, start it up. Okay, uh, Paula, my office manager and wife, likes... Uh, dark cocoa, 80% cocoa. I think it tastes like chalk. I like Hershey's, I like M&M, I like it really sweet. Uh, by, you know, of course the M&M's are very sweet, but by putting in the uh, high cocoa chocolate, that's not gonna make the ice cream bitter. What cocoa chocolate? The, uh, the extra chips you Oh, put the in. chips? Yeah, nah. that won't make it bitter? Let me tell you, you could put chips on cow dung and it would be great. <laughs> okay. Right? I mean, chocolate chips, you can put them on the soles of your feet and have a great day. <laughs> chocolate chips are chocolate chips. If you are gonna use, we'll get into this later. This is, in the book and in my philosophy, there's about a half a dozen, and you always come up with more secret ingredients. They're the secret ingredients. They're what's gonna make your ice cream Wow, that's good, that's really good. This is one of those secret ingredients. Before the coconut, that's another secret ingredient. Uh, but, you have a question? What'd you put your hand up for? It's okay. Anyway, so those are secret ingredients. I'll tell you what they all are, because like Steve, Steve see, as much as he says he's anti-hippie and anti-liberal and anti-60s, the philosophy still pervades all of us, and that is give. Because when you give, the karma in the universe, it'll come back to you. Steve, unlike any other ice cream maker, a machine maker, gives. You can get, he'll send you DVDs till you're tired of watching them. These programs he does totally free. They're on the, on the internet in a few days. Uh, all this costs him money. But he does it because he understands that he's been blessed, he's been fortunate, as I have, so you want to give back. And that's, we give a percentage of our sales to charity um, because it looks good on my tax return. <laughs> because I think that's the way to go. And you know, you'll, you'll make all these decisions yourself. I don't use a timer. Steve uses a timer, I don't use a timer. Uh, I just, uh, I keep checking the product, constantly checking. If, if you think you can do other things while you're making ice cream, you really can't. Uh, you can't leave the room. Uh, if you're going to the bathroom, then the, the way I do it, you don't have to know how I do it, but the, <laughs> my, my process is I check the consistency. That's what I'm doing when I'm looking at this because you'll get to know how much more time you have. Right now, we're still looking at liquid slurring around in there, but pretty soon we're gonna start to look at gravy and then pretty soon we're gonna look at earth. Uh, so if you want to go to the bathroom, check it and know how long you're going to be. <laughs> we won't get into that, but know what you're going there for. Uh, I'll stop there. Anyway, so uh, any questions about the M&M ice cream? When you taste it, you'll understand everything. It is truly M&M ice cream. It's not ice cream with M&Ms in it. That's a whole different deal. That you can go buy anywhere the frozen yogurt places. You can go to the, the store and do this and then pour on M&Ms, but is that really what you want to do? You don't need a machine to do that. Okay, any questions? Yes. Uh, when you say infused. When I say what? When you say infused. Yes. Have you um, ever tried the, putting in the, the, uh, the M&Ms into the, uh, the mix 
and just holding it overnight, would that make any difference? No, they're not going to melt. Um, if you boiled it, it would, but the clo it's not going to melt because the cream will be in the freezer or the refrigerator, and the M&Ms won't dissolve. Uh, the, best way, the best way I came up with infusing in this particular ice cream is to really grind it up and then uh, put it in the machine and mix it. Now I have another tool and another tip that I do at my store. I would take the M&M mixture, add it in here to the cream, and then take my reversible drill with a long paint mixer on it. <laughs> and worry it up there, you know, whirr, whirr. Uh, but the machine does just as well. And uh, that's, that's a great paint mixer tip. You should write that down. Uh, there are $3 at Home Depot. They're about this long and I cut mine down a little bit. And then you put it in a drill and it, it's, I don't use my KitchenAid anymore. I don't use my Cuisinart anymore. I don't use my Hobart anymore. I just use the drill and it's great. Nobody's writing, okay. Do I have a minute and a half? Yeah. Um, I want to drag a sample out here and show you something or explain something. Right now, and I know this tape will be around forever and people will go, what was he talking about? A big concern is Listeria. Uh, it, it affected uh, two major companies in the United States. And the first thing the press did was they took a picture, they took a reporter and put her next to Bessie the cow and they, the promo is, is Bessie here killing you? Well, that was just so disingenuous because for a lot of reasons. Bessie's not killing you. And the listeria did not come from uh, the dairy product. The dairy product that we buy and is delivered to us has been pasteurized very carefully and under very strict supervision so that it's absolutely pure. There's no anything growing in it. The machines are to National Sanitation Foundation specifications so nothing can happen there. Listeria is very unique. Listeria comes from animal excrement. And here's what the problem was. And uh, the company, and I'm not going to mention their name, Are you purposely about talking about this because they're going to eat my ice cream? Because after? you're using chips. That's why. Um, the company knew about it because they got in trouble in 2013 also. Uh, when you've got a bag of, say, M&M's because it's cheaper to buy it in a, you know, 20 pound bag than, uh, than a uh, bag like this, um, you open the bag up, you take out what you want, and you put it in the machine, and they were not sealing the bag. They were not tying it down, taking it, and taping it up, and putting it on a shelf. They were most likely leaving it around and uh, rats and mice got in there and ate, and they left uh, excrement behind, behind, which is so small you're never gonna see it, and that's where the listeria came from. It was not the cows, it was not the machinery, it was poor management who wasn't making sure that this stuff was sealed up and put away properly. So that's an important point, and it comes into play. It's never gonna come into, you're not gonna hear someone getting listeria from vanilla ice cream. It's going to come from chips, or it's going to come from cookies, or something that we're adding in. And if you treat your products properly, that's why we know you're not going to see listeria in a homemade ice cream parlor, because we know this. It's when you get a large corporation who uh, they're not doing proper training, and the guy's putting in his eight hours and going home and doesn't care that the stuff is mishandled uh, or not handled properly. So. That's important when dealing with ingredients, is that you take very good care of it. Remember, it's food, and you're feeding this to your family and to your friends and to the general public. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it is pretty easy to stay clean and sanitary. How do we get water in there? Any questions? Gee, everybody knows everything. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. <laughs> when do you pull it? The ice cream. Hmm? Well, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. He pulls it later than I do. And I'll tell you why. I just realized why last week. 
I've been doing it for five years, and it just came to me last week when I was teaching a class. The reason I pull it sooner may not be the reason I started pulling it sooner, but the reason is I use one gallon containers, and let's say I fill from a batch seven of them, which is pretty typical. So now I've got seven on a rolling cart. I cover them up with the labels on them, and then I wheel them into the back. Hang on. When I wheel them into the back, I hit two bumps dividing my floors from the front to the back. And what that does is it compacts it a little bit. And also, because it's loose, a little looser, when it sits there in the freezer, it's going to settle a little bit. That's why my ice cream is so damn creamy. And I didn't even know it. But that's why you should do it. Are Jack, we ready? can you get camera two to zoom in, please? Zoom in camera two. We're ready when you are. CB. <laughs> I'm going to let it go a little bit more, uh, but that's a pretty good rule of thumb. When it cuts like a knife, you see how it's, it cuts like a knife? Pretty much ready. Different products, different consistencies. Uh, but I guess we're good. You're going to pack this up anyway, right? So we're going to cut it off and... Isn't that nice looking? Beautiful. And it's got a great color too. Well, actually, that's a good point. Um, the colors on my ice creams aren't as good or as vibrant as the colors on a lot of ice creams because we don't use we don't use artificial colors. We don't. I could make this red and blue and green and and, and orange, but we don't do that. Okay, so let's taste this and see what you think of this. Come on up. This will be your first jolt of cream in the morning. But it should, if, if everything's right, this should taste just like M&M's, only cool and refreshing. Fruitland Park. It's an hour from here. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Hmm? Please take two. You need two? Butch. Sir. Butch was at the store last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thank um, you. Strainer. Besides making ice cream, we also give uh, plumbing tips. And a plumbing tip is to go out and buy a strainer because, remember, I made the uh, coconut sorbet. Ooh. Uh, pineapple sorbet and there's some uh, pieces of pineapple left in here and so I don't want them clogging up my drain so I'm gonna put this in the uh, sink and then pour this through it so that it all doesn't go down and clog up the drain by the end of the day so does that taste like M&M's tastes just like M&M's pretty good that was I started with six flavors this was one of them we still sell it every day it's one of the six that is carried through for six years, and we still make it every day. I'll take care of the machine. Who said that? What's the best seller? Depends. I sell two kinds of ice cream. I sell adult ice creams, which are infused with liqueurs and wines and alcohol, and I sell regular ice creams. This, of course, is a regular ice cream. In the regular ice cream, I guess right now it changes. 
Right now, the most popular one is vanilla caramel praline. Um, and in the uh, adult flavors, it's always one of three. It's always either Bailey's, Kahlua, or Mystic Slide, which is a mudslide. Yes, sir. Question you, we infuse our, our products with our liquor. You need a special permit because you're using more alcohol. What state are you in? Yeah, it depends on the state. Every state has uh, different It depends on two things. It depends on the state and it depends on the amount of, uh, of uh, extra product you're putting in. Uh, no, no, it's different with ice cream, um, and we'll get into that uh, during the break if you want. This is what mix? What percent do you use? What percent mix? Ten percent. Ten percent, which is what I use. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story if I have time for go a funny right story. Yeah, and then we'll take a coffee break. Oh, okay, good. So go ahead. When I first opened up my store. I didn't know any difference between 10%, 12, 14, 16, 18, or 22. So I ordered 10, and everything was fine. Uh, and uh, one of the original flavors that I made, which is the, the most amazing thing I've ever made, is coconut ice cream. It's in the book. The coconut ice cream is ridiculously good. It's, it, it can carry your whole store. Anyway, so there I am in my, at then little store, and it's selling my six flavors, and a gentleman walks in, a tall guy, Hispanic-looking gentleman, well-dressed, and he said, uh, oh, you have coconut ice cream. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll just try that. I said, okay, so I dished him up some coconut ice cream, and other customers are there, and he's eating it. And after 20 seconds, he comes over, and he says, whoa, this is the best coconut ice cream I've ever had. And I said, well, thanks, I'm glad you like it. He said, no, 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 I sell ice cream in Florida. I, I represent all the major dairies and I sell up and down Florida ice creams to supermarkets. Would you want to sell this into a supermarket? And I said, oh, no, I don't know. No, no. Anyway, he said, this is 18, right? And I said, what are you talking about? What, is, what do you mean 18? He said, 18%. And I said, uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's my point, here was an expert this was an expert in the business. His life is ice cream. And here he was telling me that this is 18%. All that doesn't matter. This is what matters. Because you can make um, gelato. What's gelato? 8%? Uh, yes, on average. You can make gelato, which is an 8% butter fat, and it's creamier than any ice cream you're going to taste. It's because of this. It's because of his variable speeds on the machine. Uh, I've learned how to adapt uh, my ice cream making using this machine to make the, the creamiest. That's a pretty creamy ice cream we just tasted. And nobody can tell me if it's 10, 12, 14, or 18. You just can't tell. Now, once they delivered, the guy came to deliver uh, on the hand truck all my cases of mix. And he said, we didn't have 10, so I have to give you 12. Do you want it? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know the difference. OK. So he left me 12. And that the next day, I made ice cream with it. And I dumped it. I thought it was awful. It was much too gummy. It was like, uh, you know what, butter? Like if you take, It was much too that for me. Now, I probably could have adapted my recipes to account for the extra butter fat, but I didn't know, so I didn't do it. So I dumped the ice cream. I dumped seven gallons of ice cream because it just it, it didn't taste right. So I stick with 10. That's a long-winded answer. Well, I'm going to add to your long-winded answer. OK. Um, up in New York, we um, would have what I call the fat wars. If uh, you're selling 14% butter fat in Manhattan, I'm going to sell 16%. Why? Because I want to say I'm the richest ice cream in New York. I came down here to Florida, and we're in 172 countries, so everybody thinks, well, you moved to Florida, it's a great business. Well, it's not nearly uh, the uh, volume in Florida of ice cream that you would expect. The, the biggest uh, states are all of New England, uh, Colorado, and California. 
But you come down here to Florida, and ice cream parlors fail, and I couldn't find out why. So I kept studying them and looking at them and seeing what the uh, people who were doing well were doing, and it was the people who were running 10% here in Florida. I said, why would that make such a, such a difference between 16 up in New York? haagen is 16, Ben & Jerry is 16. Well, if you eat a 16% butterfat ice cream and go out in a 95 degree heat with 100% humidity, you're going to drop dead. <laughs> it's just that simple. And it's really bad for business. Ask Jeff. Uh, it'll make you sweat. The high fat will make you sweat. It'll give you a stomach ache. And if someone gets a stomach ache and starts sweating, they don't say, oh, that high fat ice cream made me feel bad. They said, Steve Thompson's ice cream parlor made me sick. Therefore, I'm not going back to Steve Thompson's ice cream parlor. So I found out my best customers down here were selling uh, way less than 16%. They were selling 12, 10, uh, and the federal government says, if you even want to call this stuff ice cream, 10% is the absolute minimum. And I grew up thinking, oh man, that's garbage. It's not, it depends on your locale. Here in the South, we want to sell a lower fat product. And again, the, Jeff will tell you this, nobody ever walks out of his ice cream parlor and, and makes two statements. One, they do not say, man, that's the best damn fat content I ever ate. And the other one said, boy, don't you just love Jeff's uh, air content? Uh, they don't say that. They say, wow, the mint chip was really minty, and the chips in it didn't have an, a chalky aftertaste. People eat flavor. So when Jeff hit on, and he's right, uh, my, the whole purpose of all my videos, and I get, I get this from my customers, so don't worry, it won't hurt my feelings. I get so many people calling up, and they think they're complimenting me. They say, you know what, Steve? Uh, I watched your videos. I went into business, and I got to tell you, I saw those videos and I thought, if Steve Thompson, uh, if that idiot Steve Thompson can make ice cream, imagine what I could do. And that's what I want from my classes. I want the Jeff to come out and shine and make it better than I do. I used to put M&Ms, just throw it in, and it was vanilla ice cream with M&Ms. His infusing the M&Ms, grinding them up and putting in, it's like taking the flavor times 10. People don't eat fat content, they don't eat air, even though we can adjust to any air you want. Uh, they eat flavor. Flavor is everything. If you think you got enough flavor in there, you probably need a little more. Or as I like to put it, if I hand you a pale pink ice cream and you say, oh, that's delicious, what is it? I just failed as an ice cream maker because you can't tell that it's red raspberry instead of strawberry. I didn't put enough flavor in. And on that, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, Starbucks coffee break. If anybody oh, wants really? some coffee, walk around, and then we're going to come back and make speckaloos. We'll wait for everybody to get seated. This, by the way, is our three quart. It's our newest machine. This makes three quarts uh, in eight minutes. This is six quarts, 12 quarts, and then 12 quarts is um, three gallons. And then we go to 24 quarts or uh, six gallons, and then we go to the world's largest machine, which is 44 quarts, 11 gallons. So we have just about every size to match your business. Um, here we go. Jeff, we're going to start. We're going to start. We're going to make a product called, funny name, Speckaloos. Uh, Speckaloos is basically a graham cracker, peanut butter type of uh, product. It's got the consistency of a peanut butter. In the Netherlands, this is their peanut butter. This yeah. is what they eat instead of peanut butter in the Netherlands. Steve made it once a couple of sessions ago, and, uh, and I thought it was phenomenal, so I made it at the store. Uh, but you can't call it speckaloose in the store because your line will get too long, people saying what's in it, what is it, what... It, so you ha the, a lot of importance to a name in your flavor. So I called it cookie butter. And it's an amazing flavor. You'll freak when you taste this thing. And typical Jeff, he calls me up a week after I first make it. I, um, the first time I made it, and then Jeff tries it, and he calls me up and says, Steve, I make it so much better than you, and, wow. and, and I've renamed it. <laughs> well, but the he's right about I the speckle better. The reason I make it better is because I'm into flavor. And... Steve's into watching the pennies. So. <laughs> I do not watch pennies. 
I anyway, watch, I, used I, watch a lot, I used a lot more. <laughs> I bought it on Amazon. I bought a couple of cases of it. And when I was doing my flavor, I kept adding more and more, and it kept getting better and better. Okay. So, uh, but I call it Speckaloos only because for the audience here, it makes you sit up and take notice. Uh, calling it cookie butter is great. Uh, it's a graham cracker based product, so you could call it graham cracker ice cream, but I'm starting to realize that nobody knows what graham crackers are anymore. In fact, you go into the supermarket and there's this whole aisle of cookies, and then way down low, where nobody can see it, are the graham crackers. Well, what? We grew up on graham crackers. Okay, so I'm going to make sure again, the, the gate was open. I'm going to make sure the gate is closed, and I'm pouring in four quarts of mix this time. I'll save a little bit of it to help wash down the, the product. And let me turn this on. I'm going to do this as a super premium, so I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Get that started. Super premium is less air. Uh, less air, the more your cost goes up. Because if you have a high air content product, four ounces is falling off the cone. If you have haagen which is a very heavy ice cream, it's falling into the bottom third of the cone. They're both good ice creams, but if you ever have um, haagen you buy a pint of it and you take it home. And you have a taste, a little taste of it as soon as you uh, bring it home. And then you pull it out after dinner and you have a little bit then. And if you're like me at 11 o'clock at night, uh, you grab another t small taste of it. You pick at haagen -Dazs. You won't see haagen ice cream parlors. There were a couple. They were not successful because people just felt for $4, which is what they had to charge because it was so much more dense, four ounces was just in the bottom third of the cone. They said, hey, I got cheated. I only got that much for four bucks. That's the problem with uh, gelato, too. Um, so it was not, it's not a big seller in an ice cream parlor, though it's a great ice cream. And we put them in business. That was Reuben Mattis and his mother uh, back in the early 70s, their factory or their store was um, just about two miles from our factory in the Bronx, and they started with a 20-quart machine and then grew from there. And, and talk about great marketing. I don't know if how many of you, you know, Jeff said I don't like the 60s. That's not true at all. I grew up in the 60s. I just don't remember it. You know, they say, you know, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Um, but uh, back in the 60s and uh, back actually during the 70s when... Uh, haagen came out, we were all buying Scandinavian furniture. You know, everything was, uh, you know, just sticks of wood with cushions on it, and it was, it was uh, high-tech. Um, so anything Scandinavian was, was in. And so Reuben Mattis, talk about great marketing, Reuben Mattis comes up with the name haagen and he puts a map of Copenhagen uh, on the container, uh, uh, excuse me, Denmark, with a little star where Copenhagen is. And everybody thinks, oh, great, it's a Danish ice cream. No, it was made in the South Bronx. Uh, same as my machines, Murder a Week Neighborhood. And um, I called up my sister, who was living in Copenhagen at the time, and I said, what does haagen mean? And so she said, I'll get back to you. So she gets back to me a week later, and she says, it means absolutely nothing. It's two made-up words. So he's, he's got people buying Scandinavian furniture, is what we were all doing. He's got it coming, supposedly imported from Europe and from Copenhagen, uh, where it was actually coming out of the Bronx, and then later Lodi, New Jersey. And uh, he's got everybody convinced that this is really something exotic. It was all marketing, except that Reuben Mattis was a genius at flavor. He would spend a year and a half perfecting his chocolate. And if you want to prove it out, he's long since gone, uh, but you take any of the original flavors, the vanilla, the chocolate, uh, the coffee, and then go try haagen gelato, and you'll say, what on earth went wrong? Because the, uh, their gelato is now made by uh, Unilever, and Reuben wasn't around to formulate the flavors, and it's absolute garbage. But his, they were smart enough to keep his original flavors. Um, okay, so I've got the speckaloos in there, and I'm going to add... Now this is what, and Jeff's going to talk about this when we sit down in a few minutes and, and discuss business and how you, he's going to tell you all about rigidity and how you don't want rigidity in business. I told Jeff I was going to put chocolate chips into the speckloos 
and I ran it by him because he's the flavor master, and he said, hey, great. But then I was in the store, and I saw bits of brickle toffee, and I thought, oh, man, that sounds good. I think I'll throw that in. So I have no idea what it's going to be like, but I know I like toffee, and that's what, butterscotch. I think it's going to be terrific. So let me just dump that in. Don't try this with any other machine. And uh, we'll get this, I might as well start the freezing. It's spitting at me a little bit because I've got a lot of stuff in here. You literally cannot do this with any other machine on earth uh, because their fr freezing cylinders are so thin you that you'll... This? No, that's, that's for me to eat. Huh? That's for me to eat. Okay. Their freezing cylinders are so thin that it'll uh, damage the cylinder. So they make the openings very tiny so that you can't put anything in. Well, how are you going to get good flavor if you don't have it right in the machine? Jeff, do you add graham crackers? Um, no. Okay. I think I'll add some graham crackers after that gets going a little bit. You'll, you'll know that it has a, a graham cracker taste, so I'm going to throw some graham crackers in. But I think I'll do it as it's coming out uh, so that I get pieces of graham cracker in the uh, ice cream. There Soggy was a question. pieces of graham cracker. No, not when it's fresh. Yeah, you will. Uh, was there a question out there I missed? No? Okay. Oh, she's awake. Hi. Good. Uh, that will be it until lunch as far as what yeah. we're making. Yeah. So right after lunch. No problem. Uh, I need a dry container. Dry what? A dry container. I'll use one of these. You want to break them up a little? Yeah, I'm going to. Here, use this one. It's easier. Oh, good. Okay. All I'm going to do, because I want pieces of cookie in uh, my uh, ice cream, is I'm just going to break these. They break pretty easy. And you can decide whether you like the graham crackers in it or not. That's what makes it ice cream different. You can say, well, Steve put the graham crackers in, I think I'll leave it out. Steve used toffee, butterscotch. Uh, I want to use, um, I won't need too it too much. Here. All right. Uh, maybe you want to use the uh, chocolate chips. Now, when I'm finished with this, uh, throwing these cookies in, I'm going to have cookie dust in the bottom. If this was Oreo cookie, I'd have uh, black cookie dust in the bottom of this container. The tendency is you've got the tub, the ice cream finished, and you throw the cookie dust on, on top of the ice cream because after all, it's cookie dust. Don't do it. Uh, because we New Yorkers know that's not cookie dust, that's dirt. And we don't want dirt in the ice cream. So sometimes it's all about perception and looks. And I forgot to put the rest in, so let me get that down. Now the speckaloos is high in sugar and the toffee is high in sugar. So the freezing time is going to be longer than if I was making ice cream. Thanks. Um, I'll do this next class in August. Um, but this is uh, from a, a company called uh, Mad Maggie's, Steve Rapucci. And Steve's up in Boston, and he, uh, he has a separate company called Cold Molds. And Cold Molds makes molds for different products. Uh, they're they're kind of rubbery, and uh, what you do is uh, this one could be, it's got a little place for a stick. So this you could fill up and make popsicles out of it. Popsicle machines cost seventy, eighty thousand dollars. Here's something that hi Sadie, that's uh, a fraction of that cost, 
and you can fill that up, put the sticks in it, and now you have uh, popsicles. The age-old problem with making anything like popsicles or ice cream uh, is how to get it out of the mold. And in the old days, what we would do is we'd have a tin mold, hi sweetie, and we would uh, have a tub of hot water, we would dip it in, not getting it on the ice cream, dip it in for a second, get a little bit of melt, and then if you're lucky, pop them out. Well, this solves all that because they're all soft rubber and they work absolutely beautifully. Um, I was talking the other day about uh, fads and it, it brings it to this. Um, I was telling a person, I don't like fads. I, don't, I didn't think I liked fads. I don't deal in fads. Uh, I deal in trends. Hi ice cream is a trend. Gelato is a trend. Italian ices or sorbet is a trend. <clears throat> there are fads. Two years ago, the big fad in ice cream was salted caramel ice cream. And uh, probably Ann, uh, out at Byright Creamery in San Francisco, uh, makes the best salted caramel. And um, she, too, has a book out on ice cream flavors. And then the next fad was popsicles. Well, uh, everybody was doing popsicles. I haven't gotten a call for how to make popsicles uh, once this year. Uh, that's quite a switch from last year. And then, you're not going to believe this, this guy calls me up and he says, I have this new invention that I'm going to make billions on. I said, what is it? He said, well, it's, it's really incredible. I take two cookies and I take ice cream and I, I cut it out and I put it between the two cookies and then put it in the freezer. I go, man, that's amazing. What do you call it? He goes, I call it an ice cream sandwich. I go, stop the earth. It's unbelievable. You know, when did you start eating ice cream sandwiches? When, about 1950 when you were two years old? You know, what he's people, talking about this is, is a whole new generation. Chipwich. Huh? Chipwich, yes. Chipwich was a big one. But, I mean, ice cream sandwiches have been around forever. But right now, the big fad is ice cream sandwiches. So, you fill these up with ice cream, any flavor that you want, made in your batch freezer. And uh, you freeze this down. And then, uh, when it's frozen, you pop them out. And you put it between two cookies and refreeze it. And you've got a nice big ice cream sandwich. The difference is, uh, because every generation comes up with new and better ideas, they're now using very gourmet cookies. So when I used uh, Oreo cookie, uh, large Oreo cookies, they might be using a macadamia cookie or something else exotic like that. But right now the big fad is uh, ice cream sandwiches. And you would think people never heard of it before. Well, you know what? If you're 18 years old, you never have heard of it before. So it's just like Disney. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, uh, Cinderella was probably filmed in the 1940s. And they will bring out Cinderella for two weeks in the movie theaters, and then they put it away for 10 years, Disney does, and brings it back out. Because all these five-year-olds who saw it back then are now 15, 20, uh, when they get into their later 20s, they're having children, and now Cinderella is brand new all over again. They bring it out, they, they say that we've enhanced it, with better color, and they're just recycling old uh, movies that nobody's ever seen. And they're just as popular today as they were in 1940, and 1950, 60, 70, 80. So I don't shun fads. In fact, I uh, work with them. I made something called the Rainbow uh, Maker. Let me check my ice cream. That's just about ready. Um, people like to have uh, three flavors of Italian ice or three different flavors of ice cream uh, in, one, in one tub. And then what you do, let me find a tub. So, uh, and they used to use cardboard uh, to divide the tub into three. Well, the problem with that is cardboard is not very sanitary and it also attracts bugs and it's just, it's just not healthy. So I came up with what I call the Rainbow Maker. That's all stainless steel. It's virtually indestructible, although I'll show you an example of how you can ruin it. And it divides my tub into three. So now I have, say, uh, three of these, or two of them. And I make my lemon ice and put it into this section, and then the other one, that section, that section. So I'm making uh, lemon ice and putting it in one section. And then I make cherry ice and put it in the next section, and the next section, and the next section. And then I make blue ice, which is black, uh, blue raspberry, in the third section. And then when it's all done, I've got three flavors in my tub. I pull this out, and I've got three different flavors in here. 
and I scoop in a semi-circular motion uh, to hit all three flavors. I can show you after the break what it looks like. I have some from two months ago, so it's getting a little old looking, but you now divide your tub into three distinct different ice creams, and when you go to scoop it, you're hitting all three at once. Very simple, very reliable uh, invention. Let me get this ice cream out. Would you pull that at this level? What is it? You want to take a look? Ice cream? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, turn off the refrigeration. Uh, I almost forgot. I want to throw in some cookies. <laughs> take out a little more. <laughs> Spread that around. Throw in some cookies. And I'm going to hey, take the speed up cream. to help get it out of the machine. So I can run this machine automatic or manually. And that's my speculoos, or what Jeff calls it. Cookie butter. Cookie butter. Let me just get another container to get the balance. How about one of the... I'll take one of these. We could, okay. We don't have any of those quartz anymore that we usually have. Uh, Connie's got them in the other office. And let me take the rest of this out. Okay. Let's eat some ice cream. So come on up and try the cookie butter and tell me what you think with the toffee and the cookies. This is how you experiment. Oh, wait, you're not going to try it? Man. Delicious. Ah, it's good. Delicious. Oh, I love the toffee. Thank you. I'm just not sure about the cookies. I keep running into that. Because I wanted to wash down some of the uh, peanut butter, uh, the, oh. the speckaloos. It's, it's not that you could put all of it and then throw everything what? and it's, it Cookie makes it more difficult. Yeah, okay. I could, but I wanted to get it down the chute, let it wash down. I'll be right back. I guess we can sit down. What can I get you? No, I just wanted to see that one, what it looked with the, the jar. May I? She has it. Yeah, it's uh, right oh, there. Okay, thanks. We're going to sit down and talk now, so after that we'll eat lunch. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. Careful. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I saw something go down. Uh, nothing. Let me get us a couple of chairs. 
All right, I'm going to uh, mop up the mess over there. So what do you think of that product? Do you have more of the recipe? Right here. Thank you. So how'd you like that one? What do they say about a broken clock? It's right twice a day. That's it. So once in a while I make a good product. So there. Well, you know, if I replicated it at the store. Oh, I know. It would be so much better. No, I mean, it, <laughs> that means it was a good, you made a good product. Oh, right. I thought it was good enough to make. Oh, thanks. I'm going to get us a couple of chairs, and uh, we're going to sit down and relax and answer some questions. Uh, our chefs are preparing the lunch right now, and uh, so we'll keep moving. Let me go get the um, chairs. While, while he's doing that, before, I noticed this. Um, Whatever you make, whether it has chips, coconut, fruits, um, anything, uh, after you clean the machine with plain water, you rinse the machine, yeah. you're going to get a strainer full of this, uh, which is whatever you use. And I don't throw this away. I go to the last batch that I made, I pop the top off, and I just throw this on there. Yeah, I, I like to not waste anything. You, you get it? Okay. And that way, the, the next three people that get it, they get a lot of this stuff. Ah. Jeff, would you feel more comfortable on a stool? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Two, two of the questions that we had before, one was about fresh fruits and the other was about overrun. So... Um, I'll just pick one, and then he can do the other one. Uh, do the fresh fruit, please. Okay, fresh fruits. You're better at it. I don't use fresh fruits uh, at all because fresh fruits are inconsistent. Steve said before that if you come into the store in January and then you come back in September, you expect the same flavors. You can't do that with fresh fruit. Uh, even here living in Florida, where most of the fruit is imported, believe it or not, uh, we get uh, uh, mangoes from Chile, and the mangoes are great in June, but come September, the mangoes are gone, and they're not good anymore. So what good is making that ice cream? Unless you're going to make it seasonally, uh, the problem is your customers come in year-round and say, hey, where's that great mango ice cream? There are two answers for that. One is you can use the stuff on the shelf behind me and just find a, a reputable company like I Rice or uh, uh, Nielsen Massey or any of the, the good companies mm -hmm. like that. And uh, they, now I don't use them, so that's why I had to ask them. They make bottles of jugs of, of mango flavor or whatever. Uh, the other option is to buy frozen or pureed cans of that fruit. Uh, I use... Uh, Bing cherries in a lot of flavors, and I buy them frozen. They're very expensive. Uh, it's almost $20 for a, a bag of black cherries. But I know that the bag I buy tomorrow is going to be the same bag I buy in January. So that's what I use. Uh, I prefer not to use this stuff. I just simply don't want the added chemicals in my ice cream. Any questions about using fruits? Four. You have to answer the, uh, tell, tell the audience what the question is. How long do you keep the frozen fruits for? The answer is four. Forever. <laughs> yep. You had a question, sir. Yeah. What about making ice cream with great fruits? That's what doesn't exist here in the United States. What if I go to South America and want to make ice cream from a determined well, I don't know what the availability... The question was, if you live in a, in a tropical country or climate where the availability of fresh fruits is, is year-round, is that what you mean? Yes. Uh, can you do it? Uh, even though it's year-round, I don't know... I mean, I eat bananas, and certainly you can get bananas pretty much in Florida anytime. But yet, 
the bananas I eat on Thursday, I'll go Friday and pick one off the same thing as a different banana. So I have a lot of trouble using fresh fruits in ice cream. I just don't do it because of that. If you can make sure your availability, your supply of fresh fruits is consistent all the time, go for it. No, I'm talking about uh, in-season fruits. Well, that's another thing. You can sell in-season. In my store, I have things that, that are seasonal. Like I don't make pumpkin praline ice cream in the summer. I started in, in October or late September, and I go through November, December with it. But yet I get people coming in. Last night, somebody came in and said, where's the pumpkin praline? I, oh, no, they, they, something else. But it was similar to that, a winter flavor. And I said, well, I only make it in the winter. And they were pissed. They were pissed. I have 40 flavors of ice cream all the time, minimum of 40, sometimes 42, 45. But there's 40 flavors of ice cream they can pick from. You don't have the one they want. They're pissed. So with seasonal fruits, you know, yeah, a great mango ice cream, and you can make a great mango ice cream. That's a terrific fruit. But what happens in January? They come in, where's the mango ice cream? I don't have it. And then you get a whole store, oh, I'll have to settle for your, you know, pina colada, whatever. You know, so I just, uh, I just don't use fresh fruits. That's the long and short of it. I don't use fresh fruits. Frozen fruits, I'll, I'll do. You, you can use that seasonality as a marketing tool also. Up in New York, New Jersey, uh, the peaches are in season in late August. Everybody runs over to New Jersey to buy them. Uh, so I would advise ice cream parlors to have fresh, fresh peach ice cream for a week or two while peaches are in season. And then, like Jeff said, you take it off the market, and we used to get the same reaction up there. People go, where's the peach ice cream? Hey, peaches are out of season. You can't get them in the supermarket. Come back next year. They'll be lined up next year uh, for just that flavor because they know it's seasonal. Uh, when I was growing up, it was Tom Carvel, and he used to he did a thing called the he did it with soft ice cream. He did the uh, brown bonnet, which was a soft ice cream, and you dipped it into a, a fast drying chocolate. Well, for the month of um, I think it was July, he would do banana brown bonnets. He made banana ice cream and the brown bonnet, but it was only available for about two weeks. Well, we'd all run to get that because it was something special. Every, I, I own the company. I've been running it a long time. I still put on my tax return salesman because I am a salesman. And every salesman loves an opportunity to come back and see you. Well, in the ice cream business, we want to create opportunities where you'll come back in uh, to, to the store. You come back to Jeff's place not only because the ice cream's great and it's a really fun place to be, but you also want to see, what's he doing this week? And, and that's part of the mystique of a, a homemade business. And when you, make a, a, when you come out with a new flavor, I, my greatest joy is when I make a new flavor, and I think it passes my test, then at night when the store's crowded, there might be 100 people sitting around, I tell the girls, start dishing it out. And we give out little souffle cups, 5.5-ounce souffle cups with mini spoons in it, and we drop one on each table. And I gauge the reaction. And it's usually, if it passes my test, it's a good reaction. Okay, the other topic was overrun. And Steve will talk about that, and then I'll add my two cents. Good. Uh, overrun is a term that we use in the ice cream business it does, uh, and gelato business. It does not apply to water ice products because water ice just doesn't expand except the natural expansion of water, which is 17%. So overrun is talking ice cream. It's a confusing term. What do we mean by overrun? Well, let's drop the word overrun and substitute a term that you do know, which is proof, proof in alcohol. If a rum is a hundred proof, that means that it's 50% in that bottle of a hundred proof rum, it's 50% alcohol and 50% other stuff. So if I use that in ice cream and I make a hundred proof vanilla ice cream, it's 50% dairy and 50% air. Uh, we just take the term proof and throw it away and put in the term overrun. My father back in the late 50s was called down to a Senate subcommittee hearing because some Texas Southerner uh, congressman was saying, them ice cream policies is cheating the public. They, they, they're putting air in the product. And dad had to go down and explain, well, if you didn't have air in ice cream, what you would be eating is lard. It would just be heavy, fat, greasy. We need air. 
the trend has been to lower the air content in ice cream, and that's fine. That's what my infinite overrun control is all about. You can do whatever you want with your ice cream. Not me. Uh, you. You will pick what air content you want. But keep advised, there's some caveats to it. The lower the air content, the heavier the ice cream, uh, so it's going to sit heavier on your stomach. The heavier the ice cream, the more tendency towards it tasting greasy, because now you're only eating, tasting fat instead of a balanced product. I kind of compare it to the difference between a birthday cake and a pound cake. They're both cakes, they're both good, but what would the average person rather go back and have a second piece of? They'll go back for the birthday cake, not the pound cake. The pound cake, oh, that was delicious. Aunt Judy makes a great pound cake, oh, I'm full. Uh, so, but they will go back for a second piece of birthday cake. So air is important uh, to what you want to produce, but also keep in mind, you have to look at your market. Uh, if your market, and, and this is where you open the store, if you're in a market where you can get $3 for a four ounce portion, and your air content is down at haagen you're not making any money unless you're charging $4. So for every portion, you're losing a buck. So that means you've got to raise your price to $5. Well, here's my problem. My market won't pay $5. I happen to be in this small town that is uh, quite low income, and they're not going to pay that price. So sometimes it's not just the taste, but it's who you're selling to, and will this fly in this market. If I'm in Midtown Manhattan, I can sell anything I want. I've got every age group, or if I'm in Chicago or Denver or Los Angeles, I can sell anything I want. But it's, it's up to you. First, it's got to pass your test. Is this something I like and I would want uh, to you know, pass on? But I think I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, nobody walked out of an ice cream parlor and, and turned to their friend and said, you know, that's the best damn air content I ever ate. People don't eat air content, they eat flavor. That's why Jeff's ice cream comes off better than mine. Mine has uh, M&Ms in it. Jeff's has little tiny speckles of M&Ms infused through it. It's the flavor that you eat. It's not the butterfat, it's not the air content, but we'll give you whatever you want. To simplify the overrun, if you put in your machine 10 quarts, two and a half gallons, when the ice cream is finished, you extract or extrude seven gallons. So that's a lot of overrun, like 150% overrun. In some ice creams, it's okay. Uh, in some, it's not. I used to be a big fan of Breyer's vanilla ice cream, uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream, and it was great. But then they started pumping the air into it, and now it's awful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it, it's a totally different product one that I'd be ashamed to sell. Uh, so that's overrun. Uh, whatever products you put in the machine to whatever products you get out of the machine, the air pumping up the ice cream is the difference. Just like making whipped cream. If you take a cup of heavy cream in a bowl and you keep whipping it, whipping it, whipping it, you're going to get a giant amount of it. It's still the same amount of cream. It's just spread over a bigger area. Any questions? Come on. Go ahead. So with that being said... Um, with that ice being ice said... Yeah. Hmm? Milk fat. Milk fat? 10% milk fat. It came out very creamy. So what would you say your overrun today was about what, 75%? Or not, well, if, so. if we make in, in the M&M ice cream, see, every ice cream is different. He'll get less overrun in that uh, butter cookie, uh, cookie butter ice cream. Uh, in my ice cream, let's say the M&M, we put in five quarts, and we got out probably 10 quarts. That's 100% overrun. I put in And you think amount. that it's not going to be good, but it's fine. Oh. It, it's, it's all in how you make it. Uh, and like I said, if you want to uh, cheap out and make uh, ice cream, all your ice creams have a lot of overrun, so you make more money by having more servings, I think you're going to lose. Uh, my philosophy in this business is just make the best damn ice cream you can. Don't worry about the cost, because this is an inherently high profit business. Whether you're making Italian ices, cream ices, or gelato, or ice cream, inherently it's high, it's high profit. You don't have to worry about the profit. I think people get into trouble when they start crunching numbers every night and cutting corners to, to squeeze more profit out. 
uh, I never worried about the profit. Profit to me is like a puppy dog. If you keep doing the right things, the profit's going to follow you around, and it'll just be reliable as heck. You don't have to worry about it. I turned a little nothing business that, that I, and we're only open four hours a day, six days a week, and we're doing close to a half a million dollars. Four hours a day, six days a week. I mean, whoever buys my business eventually will open up, instead of four hours, they'll have 11 hours. Uh, and, and it'll just be that much greater. So it, it's just where your head is. But just don't be greedy in this business. You don't have to. If you're selling shoes, yes, your shoes are going to cost you X amount. You have to mark it up X amount. And you're going to try to cut corners by using poor quality leather and so on and so forth. In this business, you don't have to worry about it. The profit is so enormous. I used a lower speed, uh, super premium speed, when I made the uh, uh, ice cream just a minute ago because I wanted a slightly heavier ice cream for that. Uh, I was going for a wow factor that you're going to say, oh, that's the best thing I've ever eaten. Now, if I was going to do that on a permanent basis, I would try it at different speeds until I actually get the taste that I like. That, that puppy dog one's going to be a good quote for your new book, What's that? Musings of a Madman, yes. that you're uh, writing. Mad Ice Cream Man. That'll be great. Well, It'll be out sometime in uh, 2017. And as far as you're concerned, I'll just give them away, right? Yes. Just give them of away. Of course. Right. <laughs> Who else? Uh, another question. Um, just remember that, that you all have, you're all here because you want to get into this frozen dessert business, and there are many levels to get into. The simplest level being a cart. Uh, very successful people have gone through my class, and they have carts. They load them up in the morning. They make the ice cream in a location. They load up their cart. They go to fairs and festivals. It's a, it's a really cool life for a, a younger person uh, because it's hard work, but it's a cool thing. You're at fairs and festivals. You get to look at all the women every day, uh, or the men every day, and, and it's, you know, it's different. It's nice. You can have a food truck, you, an ice cream truck, uh, which is another great thing. Uh, there's a great movie out called Chef. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Guy makes uh, Latin food and he travels across the country selling it. Uh, you can do that with ice cream. Or you can have a freestanding operation like I do. Uh, uh, all of them are very high profit. It's just a question of what you want to do with your life. You wanted to talk uh, this morning about um, rigidity in, in running a business. And before you start, I just heard thunder, and does anybody else have their windows open besides me? <laughs> I'm going out to close my car windows, but uh, you start, but I want to hear this okay. because uh, Jeff has got a wonderful uh, perspective on uh, operating, the actual operating of a business. A lot of people come to my class with a, a business plan. It's their first time in this business, and they feel the need for a business plan. Uh, a business plan, you know, in month one we're going to do this and, and then we're going to expand to this and we're going to add this product in month three and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it's not in my world to do that and I advise against it because the rigidity in that is, is you're going to come up against things that you're, you're not aware of, uh, whether it be your customer base. You may open up selling uh, $2 ice creams, which is how I started. I was selling two dollar ice creams and it took me about three days honestly three days to realize this is not where I am I'm in a higher priced area and I'm killing myself I'm spinning my wheels so it went to three dollars and then seven days later it went to five dollars and that's what I sold five dollar ice creams up until about a year ago when I made it six dollars uh, the tax is included it's always been included it's a whole nother story but the price rigidity is something that I, I felt needed to be flexed a little bit. The hours have to be flexed. Your locations have to be flexed. Your personnel has to be flexed. Your suppliers, everything has to be flexed. And you've got to be able to, to dodge bullets and, and, and a little breathing room. So a business plan, unless you're a franchise already in existence and you're buying a franchise ice cream from somebody, or you have vast experience that I'm not aware of, a business plan is going to hurt you. Uh, it's such an easy business. This is, this is the simplest business you're ever going to get into that you'll work very hard at. The business is very simple. You buy supplies, you make ice cream, and you sell it. It's, it's, 
I mean, far from rocket science, it's an easy business. You make your own hours, you make your own days, you hire your own employees, you decide the quality of your ice cream, you decide how much you're going to charge. It's, it's just incredibly simple. Uh, and you can make an awful lot of money in it. Just be flexible. It, my advice, my opinion, just be flexible. Uh, that being said, I'll promote my course, right? Why course? Oh. oh, you mean how to run a business. <laughs> right. I, I offer a two-day class <laughs> that, uh, in my opinion, is a virtual guarantee of success. It's very intense. It's not something you take on a lark. It's, uh, it's about 10 hours every day, two days, uh, and it's in a working ice cream parlor where you'll learn how to scout a location, how to find a place, how to prepare for opening, how to open your store, how to market your store, how to make the ice cream, how to come up with ice creams, how to create recipes, how to hire employees. Uh, and then in this class, we also work in the kitchen for a good eight hours uh, or longer, making Italian ices, cream ices, and uh, what do you call it, super premium ice cream? High quality ice cream. Uh, and uh, when you leave, you leave there with a, a workbook that's tailored to your particular needs. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I do it about six times a year, uh, and it usually follows our class here. Uh, and that's it. Uh, it's tomorrow and Friday, of course. And you have two spaces left? Uh, we have four, but I prefer only two. Uh, it's, uh, it's limited to ten. I prefer eight. Uh, and that way everybody... Uh, really, really learns, and that's, that's what I want. Uh, you get a nice apron, too. <laughs> Any knowledge that you can get in the business is, is going to be helpful. Um, that's why I started doing these tapes a few years ago, to give out as much uh, information as I possibly could before you get into business. Uh, I get a, the same phone call from people all over the world. They say, I'm going to uh, give me some names of customers that I can go visit and, and interrogate. Well, I don't do it. I know my competition does it, but I won't do it because you don't want them, when you're in business, you don't want them coming to your store and say, hey, I want to copy you. Tell me everything that you've learned over the past 20 years. It's not fair. Uh, I don't, you know, it's going to leave a bad taste in their mouth. And, and other people say, well, I'm going to go get hired by an ice cream parlor so I can learn all their ideas. You know, ice cream owners are very good entrepreneurs. They're not stupid. We're not going to hire someone who is very well dressed and 45 years old and think that they want to make a career scooping ice cream in my store. They know that you're there to steal the things. Uh, I'm involved in other uh, venues. Uh, I am part of Penn State, which does a two-day course uh, at the end of January. And uh, it's extremely good, but it's an overview of uh, ice cream and things we're talking about today. Uh, just like this course is. This course is not going to put you into business. This course is designed for free to uh, show you what you can do and, and try to spur some ideas in your mind. But if you can get into a real bona fide course, uh, Jeff's course, where it's going to be nuts and bolts hands on, uh, that's going to be uh, really helpful to you. And there just aren't opportunities like that out there. Um, a lot of people want to get into the business, but uh, it's difficult to get the knowledge. And it would be true if you wanted to go into becoming a dry cleaner or a clothing store or a shoe store. Uh, finding the information is hard to do, uh, but executing uh, the project and getting into business, you know, and we also, make it easy. And also think about the difference, a dry cleaning store, a shoe store, a clothing store. Those aren't want-to careers. Those are have-to careers. This is a want-to career. Yeah. This is, this is, I mean, I wish I had come to his little class when I just got out of college. Uh, it, it's just phenomenal, the ease of this business and the elasticity of it. You can do whatever you want. I mean, you can have six stores in two years. It's that easy if that's what you want to do. Or you can have a, a, I had a guy come through my boot camp and he had a cart in northern Ohio, a cart business, and now he's got 13 carts at last count, and he sends his troops out in the morning on Saturday, Friday, and they go out and they do fairs and festivals. And his job is counting the cash at the end and hoping they don't steal too much. 
uh, they will steal. Uh, well, it's the same in any business. Don't forget, this is a, a cash business. Uh, I don't even take credit cards. You might, but pretty much you're going to get cash. And it's very easy. Uh, everybody steals. Uh, it's just a question of how much. So if you can keep it to a minimum, you're fine. If anybody wants, uh, out there in internet land, if anybody wants information on the class, you can reach me at uh, the email. Because it's easier than phone calls. I get a lot of phone calls, but email's easier. And please note the spelling. It's pronounced X hippie but it's spelled completely different. People call me up and say, I couldn't get through to Jeff because of the spelling. Well, he's a little dyslexic in the spelling, so uh, take a note that uh, it's X-H-I-P-P-E-E -E at AOL.com. And Jeff returns all his emails. He's, uh, that's really important to me. Uh, I'm, I'm big on loyalty and I'm big on uh, service to customers, and it amazes me how some companies you know, leave a message and you'll never hear from him again. I mean, I, I, I flounder once in a while, but not too often. And Jeff has been my experience because people call me up and say, you know what, I contacted Jeff and he was back to me like that. Uh, that's important in business is to keep in And just as important, contact. when you buy any of Steve's products, you get his home phone number. And, and you can call him at 11 o'clock. He won't, uh, maybe he'll be sleeping or whatever, but you can call him anytime when he's on his yacht. Uh, when he's playing polo. Or in the boat, and, on the, uh, or, uh, the plane. Right, on his private jet. Yeah. He'll always answer your phone calls. Uh, it's kind of cool to, to know that the owner of an immense company like this is, is at your disposal. Well, so I do speak. it because it's such a fun business, and you're working nights and weekends, so I feel I have to be available nights and weekends. Good point. And um, I, I, had a, I, I actually had a boss once many, many years ago, and he had a wonderful comment. He said, if one customer calls up with a problem and you solve it, you're a hero. Uh, if 10% of the McDonald's stores call up uh, with a problem, you're a villain. You're in real bad shape. So I have always uh, geared my business not towards franchises. Uh, you know, maybe we'll go five or ten, something like that, but no big franchises because I personally want to deal with uh, a one-on-one -on -one basis with the my customers. Guy. The little guy. The little guy. The little guy. You've put more little guys and couples in business than probably uh, any 10 companies. Well, thank you. And really? if you don't mind me saying, one of my biggest successes has been this past year with the CB350 countertop. People buy that uh, knowing that as their business grows, they're going to have to run it 16, 18 hours a day. That's a lot of time in front of a machine. Mm. Uh, but if you watch Shark Tank religiously like I do, you'll see that as a new entrepreneur and starting up a business, you do everything. You work incredibly long hours, you don't hardly get any pay, and you do all the work that needs to be done, but you also get all the glory and the satisfaction at night. Well, that's why people buy the countertop, because one, uh, the main one is they can't afford a large machine. They'd like to have one of the bigger ones, but they have to start with the countertop because it's affordable. And I get them into business, and then they, their business grows, uh, they all grow, and they come back and buy larger machines. But before that happens, Jeff, I came on an idea which I was really excited about. A lot of people doing push carts and starting off selling Italian ice because the product is so cheap. Well, most of the Italian ice, if you're down here in Florida or if you're in Alabama or, or anywhere else but the East Coast, trying to get Italian ice from a wholesaler, it's coming out of New York or New Jersey. And you're paying... Uh, to have it shipped down here, and the quantities are so large that your minimum order is going to be about $1,000, and you have to go out and rent space. So my $5 tub of Italian ice is going to cost you $65. Uh, and that's what people start off doing. Uh, or they come to me and they buy a machine. So I came up with the idea, all right, you own the CB350, you're doing your fairs and festivals, and your business is starting to grow. And invariably, people are coming up to you and saying, hey, you know what, where'd you get that ice? Uh, oh, I make my own, or I won't tell you. Um, I told my customers, you'll probably have 20 people easily coming up to you and saying, where'd you get that ice? Instead of saying, uh, go away, say, well, I make it myself. And you know what, I'll make it for you too. Uh, here's what I'll do. You call me up with any size order you want on Wednesday, and I'll make it, and I'll have it ready for you Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Don't come before Friday at 4 o'clock, and you pick it up. You pay cash for it, 
and you take it away and you take it to your pizza parlor, you take it to your push cart and you start selling ice. So now you've gone as the owner from one push cart, maybe two, and they're not cheap and that's how you're expanding the business to now all of a sudden you've got 20 customers who are buying ice from you and you're charging them $25 a tub for something you're making for five. You're making a nice profit. You're also controlling the market. Let's say you're in this uh, nice park, or let's say you're in the next to the retirement community where Jeff is. That's Jeff's territory. And I, in my mind, do not allow anybody else into Jeff's territory. Because, number one, it doesn't make sense. The best they can do is hope to get 30% of Jeff's business. And why start a business when you're going to have a 30% you know, failure on you to begin with? Mm -hmm. So here you are making ices, and all of a sudden the guy you're selling ices to starts coming into your park or your festival. You cut them off. You say, you'd be a New Yorker. You say, hey, no, no more ice for you. And uh, you stop selling them to them. So you're literally, you're, you're, helping, you're, not, you know, you're helping 20 other people. You're making money from 20 other people, but you're also controlling where your ice goes. I, and, and my ideas are not original. I hear them somewhere. And it just occurred to me there was this old man named Michelizzi. He was old when I was 20. He, he must have been 104 when I was 20. And he was in Bridgeport. And he sold Italian ices, and he had people come to his store and pick up ices. But if he didn't think you ran a clean operation, cut you off, just like that. And, and then they'd call me and say, I got cut off by Michelizzi. I go, oh, your place is that dirty, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you can grow a business without a lot of money. You don't, Jeff has taught me this. You don't need a lot of money uh, to get into business. You need a desire to work long, hard hours, and then when you start making it successful like Jeff, then you can look at your equipment and say, you know what, I've got a CB350. If I had a 24 quart, I would cut my time down from 16 hours uh, to four hours every other day. And that's exactly what you did, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you, you, you needed other places to run the business, so you ended up buying a bigger machine, which cut your labor cost. And it becomes, after it becomes, after survival comes labor cost. Right. They have lunch for us. If, if okay. Any questions right before lunch? Uh, yes. Um, when you talked about using stabilizers and you started to mention that you did not use stabilizer, what is the difference in using them and how long each of them last? Stabilizers uh, in, in Italian ice, uh, first off, is very tricky uh, because uh, if you use anything chemical, you can taste it in the ice. Sugar and water is very clean. And if you go throwing in something that's not good, um, I, I like the one I use, which is Main Street Ingredients. I also like the iRice Stabilize. That's a good one. Uh, most of the ice cream stabilizers do not work in sugar water. And you, uh, by the way, you know that if you're going to sell it quickly, you don't need that. And that's my contention, is sell it quickly. It's what I said at the beginning. You wake up at 6 in the morning, you grab your cup of coffee, and you look at the weather channel and you say, what's it going to be for the next three days? You know, don't just say, okay, I got to wake up today and make 40 gallons of lemon ice. Well, what if there's a bad storm coming through? You're not going to sell it. So, especially in the ices business, be weather dependent. Uh, Jeff makes all his product fresh. Um, that's, that's a little harder to do. That's more labor for him, but it's his reputation. That's well, the way it is. And I also, uh, if I have a new flavor, I don't go ahead and make full batches of it, double ba I normally make double batches, but I don't do that with a new flavor. I make uh, three gallons, just to see how it goes that night. We just made Bananas Foster, and I knew it would be a hit, but still, you don't want to make 15 gallons of it, because you don't want it to sit. So I made uh, three and a half gallons of it, and it, it sold out right away, and, and now that's two weeks ago, I made it three times already because it's really a big hit. So what about, what's the typical shelf life on non-stabilized on it? On ice, ice cream? cream? Yeah. Um, I, I, thankfully, I can't answer that. I, I can. Uh, at 30 below zero, it's about six months. Uh, in your dipping cabinet, it's the freshest, technically, for 10 days. Personally, I'd like to have it be no more than three days old at the most. Absolutely. But I, I ran into a lady once, and she called me uh, last fall, and she said, I've got a tub of bubblegum licorice ice cream in my freezer at 30 below. And this is five months later. Is it any good? I said, yes, ma'am. It's as good as the day you made it because it's at 30 below zero. However, 
The fact that it's sitting in your freezer for five months tells you that nobody likes bubblegum licorice ice cream. It's a lousy flavor. Get rid of it. You know, if it isn't turning over in a few days, you're in love with your ice cream and nobody else is. And I'm guilty of that. I like coffee. I like bananas. Say, let's make banana coffee ice cream. It was so bad to everybody else that I couldn't give it away. But I think it's, oh, don't yeah, the shark. Uh, but personally, I, I thought it was a win-win because now I still have five gallons of uh, coffee banana ice cream that I'm eating all by myself, little by little. When you get good at it you'll, and you understand your customers, it's not all for you. The quality is for you. But the flavors, it's for them. And once you get good at where you are and who your customer is, you won't have any problem. You'll know what to make a lot of, what to not to make a lot of. I'm on a different end. I, I do retail, but I also do a lot of wholesale. So when I sell to like the restaurants and hotels, the main question they always ask me first is how long it lasts. So, you know, just so I know for certain. Well, um, they shouldn't have to worry about that. It, I used to sell wholesale, and I went to the, the uh, restaurants, and I saw what they did to the ice cream and how awful they took care. No, so I pulled it out. I, I gave up wholesale. I didn't like how they were doing it. You see how nothing phases him? I made Sharknado Italian ice. Sharknado, the B movie, was all the rage at the time, and I said to Jeff, I am going to make something that's going to you know, move heaven and earth. And I let you. And he let me. And so I made cherry Italian ice, and I got candy corn, you know, for, because shark's teeth are that shape. And so I made cherry Italian ice and candy corn. Candy corn. And, They're hard before you put them in there. And they get harder when you freeze them. And when you I, freeze and, them. And I told the world, you can have my Sharknado Italian ice. And, and, of course, the cherry ice looks like blood. It's bread, blood red. And I told the world, you can have my formula for free. All you have to do is call me up, and I'll give you the formula. That was a year and a half ago, and I'm still waiting for that phone to ring. <laughs> but, but we had the shark in the video. You can see it. It's buried in 119 hours somewhere. I had one, no, don't pull the plug. I had one of my employees throw the shark in, and I thought, you know, Jeff goes, what the? And we had to, you know, delete it out. <laughs> and so that's why we have now, the shark. Whether you like the products that you're tasting or not is really irrelevant. Uh, the relevancy comes when you sit there and understand that you can do better. And that's where I sat. Uh, one of the flavors that will be made today by Steve is one of the ones I tasted that put me in the business because of how bad I thought it was. <laughs> that's true. Have you made all of your ice cream? Just you or do you trust your employees to do it? No, I make the ice cream. I would turn it over, but I haven't found somebody yet who I trust enough to... You know, every time... You, I have recipe cards. I have hundreds of them over the years, all the ice creams I've made. And if I just gave that card to somebody and said, make the ice cream, it wouldn't be the same. Because I'm forever adapting and tasting and changing. Uh, even my sacred coconut ice cream recipe, I just changed because I, I felt it was too something, so I adapted it a little bit. And then I changed it on the card. Uh, every time I make ice cream, not every, to certain flavors I don't even taste because I know, and they're very basic, two ingredients, three ingredients. But some of them, uh, pina colada comes to mind, it's got five, six ingredients in it, and you know, you're changing things, your tastes change. And also, as Steve said, if, if, you, if you see it sitting there two weeks, if I've got a flavor that's two weeks and I haven't had to remake it, think about it. You know, maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. Maybe you have to change it a little bit. The concept may be good. The name may be good. But maybe it's a little too sweet. Maybe it's a little too flavorful. Maybe it's not flavorful enough. Maybe it was too soupy. Maybe whatever. So when I see, we have a list in the back in our inventory and aside from the huge inventory, because we have many freezers, there's a little thing on the side, flavors to be made. And the girls know when we're down to X amount, put it on the list so I'll know that it's coming up to make it. And if I see uh, flavors that are constantly on that list, we have winners. Those are winners. And if I see others that, boy, I haven't made that in a long time, well, why not? You know, I think it's great, but obviously it's not great. Luckily, we don't have that anymore because the flavors are all great.
But sometimes a new one. Can I tell you about a, a failure? Can I tell them real quick about real a quick. failure? I love Sambuca. I, I, I used to look because you get whacked on it, and it's, it's good. <laughs> and I like Sambuca. So I thought, well, hell, Sambuca ice cream, here we come. So I made ice cream out of it, and I called it Slambuca. And, man, it was good. And nobody bought it. It was awful. I mean, I thought it was good. But the employees didn't even want to take it home. That's how bad it was. <laughs> That's how bad it was. So that taught me a lesson that I can't be the, uh, the, the end all to this. I have to take into account sales. So Jeff loves his Sam Buka ice cream. I love my coffee banana. I say, enough of this lovemaking. Let's eat. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> have lunch. There's the food. All right, so, yeah, let's see. It's a great day for the shark outside. Who's got a dollar? Oh, Jeff does dollar. magic tricks. It's no magic trick. It's just a business uh, uh, demonstration. What's your name? George. George, George's dollar. So if you want to make money in this business, you have to work hard, but it's very simple. You take your dollars and you keep dividing them. You keep making more and more until the end of the month when you count up your mores and you see what you've got and then you go to the bank and you deposit all your mores and simply you make that kind of money. I have no idea. Please, please. That's pretty amazing. On your, on your sheets, it says that we're going to make uh, Snickers ice cream, but I decided not to. The most popular candy bar in the world, right? Snickers? Anyway, uh, what I thought we would do, we could make, you can do this same thing with Snickers, Milky Way, Nestle's, any candy bar. Any candy bar. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to try it when I go back. Next week, I'm going to try uh, Twix. Is that those cookie ones that snap in? Yeah. Because uh, they seem to be really popular. Uh, when I got here, I put candy in the freezer. So let me get that now. How'd they do? I don't know how he does that dollar trick. I think he's got a pocket full of torn up dollar bills. <laughs> what do you say about me? Okay, I said so I don't the, know how to do the trick. I don't know how you do it. These are Milky Ways, right from the store. And all I've done is cut them into three pieces. Got it? So what we're going to do, and I don't know if this is going to work because I don't know how frozen they are, but we'll give it a shot. We're going to put them in the Ninja. Milky Way is a great candy bar, by the way. You all like Milky Ways? What would be the best way to make Milky Way ice cream or Snickers ice cream? Hmm? Candy bars. Sure. I mean, that's the only thing we know what it tastes like. So why not make it out of what we're familiar with, which is, that's what the book says. See the front of the book? It says, go supermarketing. That's what I believe in. And that's how I started the business. I went to the supermarket, loaded up my cart with all sorts of stuff that I thought would be great as ice cream. And that's it. So what we're going to try to do here is try to make, remember the M&M dust? We're going to try to make Milky Way dust. If you can make dust, you can make great ice cream by infusing it. Are you translating as I'm going along? That's cool. Uh, now I've done. Now, by the way, has anybody ever had Ben and Jerry's Heath Bar Crunch? Phenomenal ice cream. You can make it better by infusion. Just do the and Heath Bars. You're you're one step ahead because they sell it at Restaurant Depot already chopped up. They sell Heath Bars already chopped up, which is great. Poopy doopy. Just kidding. 
Uh, how many bars? Ah, how many bars? Now, by the way, when you look at these things, oh, it's a thing of beauty. Nougat, caramel, and chocolate. Ah, what a country. Milky Way's been around a long time, right? It's one of the staples of uh, American culture. Works. Now, you can't do this with a blender. It just doesn't happen. But with a ninja, it happens. So, and now think of the possibilities. I mean, whether it's Asian candies, Latin candies, German candies, anything you want. One of the guys in my class two times ago asked me if I ever tasted Ferrer Roger. You know what Ferrer Roger is? Those no. little things in the gold balls that they're chocolate and... And I said no. So he went out that night and he bought a couple of trays of them. They come in trays. And uh, we froze them and made the most amazing ice cream ever. So you think about the possibilities. Here we are making Milky Way ice cream. I've used seven bars in this. We're going to make a half batch. And uh, the reason we make a half batch is because that's what Steve allots me in the machine. Huh? What? You mean because of the size of the machine? Yeah. Oh. So there we have it. Now, you, it is important that you freeze these, otherwise you end up with a gummy mess. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take our seven uh, Milky Way bars. All that gummy peanut butter substance in there and the toffee and everything else. Two warm rinses and I'm finished. And that's normally a hard ice cream to uh, clean up after, but that's all it takes is two rinses. Maybe it took me, what, five minutes? And this is what we wind up with. Yeah, powdered Milky Way bars. Think of the possibilities. They're endless, aren't they? And rather than make vanilla ice cream and throw those chunks on top of vanilla ice cream, or even inside of vanilla ice cream, really you're not going to get Milky Way ice cream. We're actually making Milky Way ice cream. If the Milky Way company made ice cream, this is what they'd do. They'd make Milky Way ice cream. So we have seven Milky Way bars. And then we're going to add five uh, quarts of mix. How much vanilla? Right. Now, will there be much overrun in this ice cream? Sure. There'll be uh, a good amount of overrun. We're, don't forget, we're starting with five quarts. Let's see what we end up with. And the vanilla, we'll use five ounces of vanilla as well. I don't see a need to add chips or um, extra chocolate or anything because all we want is Milky Way bars. So normally when you're making a vanilla ice cream, you're adding the vanilla beans that you're cutting out of the vanilla. No reason to do that because it's not the predominant flavor. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> normally what? when you make vanilla, you take the vanilla beans and you scrape out They'll the answer beans. that. Why do we add the vanilla beans? For the flakes, for the dots. So you don't Otherwise, the liquid vanilla is just as good. So you don't need that in this. Would you raise that 
grate there, please? You don't need that in this because uh, you. you've got all the other stuff in there. The dots would just disappear. Now, uh, you notice that I rinsed the machine out, uh, but you don't have to. The reason I did is because of this class. Uh, I didn't want any alien chocolate chips in there, uh, but normally if I were in the store and I had made M&M ice cream, I wouldn't rinse out the machine. I'd just go right into this candy. And it's okay. That's the, that's the uniqueness of homemade. That's why homemade is so good. So how many ingredients in this? Three. How simple is that? Now that's, I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Okay, so we're going to start it up. And we're going to let the machine do the mixing. Is there a reason why you put the mix in first? You know, just oh, sure. Well, as I said before, what we can do is we can add Milky Ways to this and use my drill gun yeah. to mix it up, but I forgot it. Uh, oh, okay. You know, so I'm, no I'm on location today. So we're going to let the machine do it. And the only difference is we're going to let this mix a little longer than normal. Normally, if I did that, you pour it in, you hit the refrigeration right away. But now we'll just let it mix a little bit. Two thirty four. Speed two thirty four RPMs. Revolutions per minute. So what's your favorite candy bars? I mean think about it, you could make good and plenty this way. I mean not that you'd want to, but what is it? Butterfinger. Now, I have Butterfinger at the store, and I haven't done it yet. I, I bought the, the Butterfinger bag because uh, it also comes in pieces, and I haven't done it yet. Now, my next flavor, after Steve does something, is another candy, but it's very different than... It, it's become our biggest seller in, in candy-flavored ice creams. That's a little tease in case any of you are going to leave early. <laughs> Butterfinger's great. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to do payday. You know what payday is? Used to be my favorite candy bar. Huh? What you call it? Yeah. And ten thousand dollar reward or whatever. So the machine is is infusing for us our ice cream. It's doing the work for us. Nothing is necessary. It's what you want to do. I spare no expense in my ice cream. And look how rich I am. It just shows you how much profit there is. Why would you spare the vanilla? Well, because of the number of Milky Way bars that you put in. Yeah, but the Milky Way bars are not going to be the you're not a baker, are you? If you were a baker, no, I'm serious. If you, well, then you know about vanilla. If you bake without vanilla, it'll taste like, um, no, no, no. It'll taste like, uh, what's that, Pop Entenmann's in the store or Little Debbie's in the store. If you want, like when you make brownies, the box doesn't call for any additional vanilla. But if you use additional vanilla, your brownies will be better than his brownies. It's just one of those things. It's, how do you explain it? Um, it's vanilla. It, to me, vanilla is essential. I go through, uh, now I make my own vanilla, but I used to go through a case a month of vanilla. That's six liters. 
Now I make my own. Uh, and, and I still can't keep up. I still have to supplement it with buying some. How do I make my own vanilla? Ha ha. How do you make your own vanilla? How does he make his own vanilla? How do I make my own vanilla? Vodka. Well, I take the husks. When I use the vanilla beans, you, you slice them, you, you, what do you call them? You uh, score them down the middle, spread them open, and take the blunt edge of a knife and scrape them out, put them in a cup, however much you need. I use one bean per quart. It's a lot of beans. Beans are very expensive. I pay about $100 for a half a pound of beans. But that's what it is. You know, it's, it's just what it is. Remember years ago, guys will remember this, Years ago, you were always breaking a shoelace. When you pulled them tight, they would break and you'd get pissed. You had to tie a knot, remember that? And you tied the knot over the eyelet so that you could pull it tight again. They don't break anymore. Shoelaces don't break anymore. How come? Because they made them better, obviously. But when I grew up, shoelaces, you know, you pulled it, bam. Especially in the morning, you had to go to school, bam, they broke. And if it was on a sneaker and it broke, then you have this little piece and you gotta tie a knot, it's real hard. So I noticed they don't break anymore. Shoelaces never break, ever. They never break anymore. You pull them as hard, but they don't break anymore. The reason they don't break is that they, and they didn't have to, they sold more shoelaces when they broke. But now they don't break, they made better quality shoelaces. Where is that going? I have no idea. Did you ever think that you'd be here to listen to philosophy according to Jeff? <laughs> So I think we're ready. I think it's all mixed. We're going to taste it. I've never made this before. But I have confidence because I made M&Ms before. And I made, uh, I used the same formula for M&Ms, the same weight of M&Ms. It's still 32 ounces of Milky Way bars. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, we'll turn this on, and that's it. We're ready to roll. Three ingredients, or if she were making it, two ingredients. <laughs> What's simpler than that? Two ingredients. And it's, it's as sweet as we want because the Milky Way bars. It'll be as creamy as we want because of the cream, and it'll, it'll be great. This is gonna be a great thing to have. And if you think about it, Kit Kats, Butterfinger, Payday, any candy you want. Go to the store, any candy bar you want, throw it in the freezer, grind it up in a Ninja, you're good to go. You can't use a blender though. Hmm? What's that? No, I don't know, I don't have good luck with a Cuisinart. It's still one blade on the bottom, isn't it? Even though it's slicing, it's, this is an, they thought of this, it's an amazing thing. And they're cheap enough. They even sell these on TV late at night. But you don't want the whole kit. You just want this. Yeah, the, you can buy these for 60, 70 bucks. And as I said, I've got five of them and I haven't had one break yet. I even have the old style on one of them that works by pushing the top down. There's no buttons or anything. It, that's the first one. And it still works fine. And that's our main milkshake blender. Okay, what? What about what? What about what? How do you make? How do I make the vanilla? How do I make the vanilla? People ask me how I do that dollar bill. They say, how do, you, how do you do that? And my answer is, very well. So my answer to you, how do I make the vanilla? Very well. I make the vanilla by, when I, I buy cheap vodka in the 175 liters. Uh, and I open them up, and when I'm scraping the beans, I take the husks and the nibs, the ends, and I throw them in the 175. And then I seal it up. And how many per? Maybe uh, 
20, 25, and then I let it sit for a week, and then it's pretty much ready. You can see it gets dark. When you can't see through it, it's ready. And I have about, I don't know, eight of them lined up uh, in various stages of being ready. And that's it. That's it. How simple is life? You drop the husks in the vodka, nothing, nothing. It's the best vanilla, you, you can't buy a vanilla that good. One fold, two fold, six fold, you can't buy vanilla that good. Problem is you can't make it enough of it. But that's all right. And now I started putting it in bottles of rum. So I have vanilla rum. And I use rum a lot. So now I use my, sparingly, but I use my vanilla rum. It's a whole world opening up, isn't it? <laughs> you have anything you want to add? Not at the moment. Okay. I'm just wondering if we fleeced you, would we find little pieces of dollar bills in your pocket? <laughs> and then you say, it's worth it to me to do pull the trick off for a buck. He's not talking. He's not talking. I don't know. I can't figure that one out. Magic was never my strong suit. Imagine if I had short sleeve shirt on, what I could... Oh. <laughs> yeah. You need this? I what? don't know. No, what um, are you making? I'm making a Bordeaux sorbet. That's what I... Uh, okay. And then you're making ice cream. Oh, so I better put this back, right? Yeah, you got one more to go. Right. What I have is the best one for last. Save the no, best one for last. Any questions so far? Say you do. Okay. Um, the next thing we'll be going into after Jeff makes that is a Bordeaux wine sorbet. Um, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between Italian ice, sorbet, sorbetto? And there's a lot of false answers out there. The actual answer, the true answer is, there is no difference. Sorbet is sugar, water, and flavor. Italian ice is sugar, water, and flavor. Frozen lemonade is sugar, water, and flavor. They're all the same. Um, if I give you, this is called a squeeze cup for those of you uh, not from New York. And the way we eat this is, this is a three and a half ounce squeeze cup. So we put four ounces in here, it's falling off the top, and we eat it from the bottom up. We eat it like that. And they're very inexpensive and they're a lot of fun. Sorry, what? We squeeze it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you go to buy squeeze cups, uh, every paper supplier on earth will look at you like a deer in the headlights. They have no idea what you're talking about except in New York. That is technically, technically called a pleated water cup. You know how we have the bottle of water in the uh, kitchen? You might have a bunch of these for water. You drink it and then throw it away. <clears throat> We're in a hospital. A doctor might give you some pills. They put it in this. And they get Pleated, like a lady's dress. Pleated water cup. As for a squeeze cup, they never heard of it. There's only one manufacturer in the world. It's Solo, S-O-L-O. -O. The difference between this as a raspberry Italian ice and, and a raspberry sorbet is how you serve it. For this, I'm going to get $1.50. For this, I'm going to get $5.50 in a restaurant. It's the same product, sugar, water, and flavor. Uh, if there is any difference at all, it's that I'm using fresh frozen raspberries as opposed to a raspberry extract. Uh, but if anybody ever tells you different, sorbet, sorbetto, Italian ice, all the same thing. The Italians hate to admit that because they want to make it sound like it's more different and more special. It's not. Yes? Okay, can you, make, can you make Italian ice or any water ice product out of Splenda, Stevia, or any of the other products? The answer is no. Uh, they, they lack what we call solids. In the dessert business, uh, you're freezing solids. In ice cream, your primary solid is cream. Uh, in uh, Italian ice, the primary solid is sugar. If there's no sugar in there, if you just use Stevia, or Splenda or something like that. All you're freezing is water. Uh, you cannot make, you can, but I'm gonna say you cannot make a sugar-free Italian ice. There is a way to do it, and you won't like it. 
you substitute the sugar for a product called a chemical called multidextrin. The problem with multidextrin is it will freeze, but it will give you, if you eat more than about four ounces of it, it will, I guarantee it will give you a severe case of diarrhea. Uh, if you go into CVS and buy uh, sugar-free candy, sugar-free chocolate, it says eat one or two. More than that may cause stomach distress. Well, I never do anything halfway. So the first time I bought sugar-free, because I'm a diabetic, is I ate the whole bag. What a disaster. And if you sell sugar-free Italian ice, that's what you're going to do to people. And believe me, they'll remember you. They'll remember the ice. If you want to substitute, if you want to substitute for cane sugar, you can use agave. Agave is what they make um, tequila out of. And about ready? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Agave is what they make tequila out of. Uh, being a diabetic type one, insulin dependent. There's a thing called the glycemic scale. It's one to 100, 100 being the worst. Uh, on a scale of one to 100, sugar comes in at 92. You can't get much worse. Agave comes in at 27. So if you wanted to give someone a more healthy product, you could do it with agave. It's, about, it's way more expensive than sugar. It's about one and a half times more sweet than sugar, uh, but it's not the cure-all. The, the proper answer for a diabetic Eating Italian ice is you shouldn't be eating Italian ice. It's, it's that simple. Um, but that's how you can do it. You can do it with agave. You can use honey. You can use uh, maple syrup. Uh, these are all going to impart flavors, though. Uh, if you're making a cherry ice, you're going to have the maple syrup battling with the uh, cherry, which doesn't happen in sugar. The cheap Italian ices, if you read the label, say corn syrup. Corn syrup is made from corn. It's about uh, one and a third times sweeter than cane sugar. It's very cheap, and it makes your product sticky and gummy. So I don't use corn sugar, though. Some people like to add cane sugar and corn sugar because the corn sugar acts like a natural uh, smoother. It makes the product smoother. Um, Italian ice formulas, they're all throughout my website. I give it away all for free. But there are differences depending on region. This is kind of fun. In New York, on a bigger machine, I use seven pounds of sugar, 14 quarts of water, and two quarts of lemon juice. It's the sugar-water ratio that you're concerned about in freezing. I use seven pounds of sugar. If I go down the Jersey Turnpike to Philadelphia, the name changes from Italian ice to Italian water ice. Same stuff. They like their Italian water ice smoother than New Yorkers. So they add a pound of sugar, here we go, and it makes it smoother. That looks good. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, you want to come up and try Jeff's fantastic concoction here? At the end, when, when he's using this machine right here, at the end of the cycle, right before it's about to cut off, it makes like that noise. Is that mm -hmm. what that, what kind of, is that just everything? He just has a little freezing to the walls. Uh, if he had left the uh, beater to spin for another 10 or 15 seconds while the gas is getting away from the barrel, it wouldn't make that noise. But see, the gas hasn't been able to escape yet, and he's pulled it all out, so it's an empty barrel with refrigeration still going to it. You just wait 10 seconds. <laughs> You know where uh, Wazoo City is? Yeah. It's obviously from the movie. <laughs> Not sweeter. Not sweeter. No, an extra pound of sugar won't make it sweeter, uh, but it will make it smoother. Uh, sugar enhances flavor. You're it makes welcome. It more intense. So a Philadelphia ice has more intense flavor than a New York ice. And at the other end of the spectrum, up in Rhode Island, they sell a product we they call slush, though not slush like a 7-Eleven. It's not eight pounds stores, of sugar. It's not seven pounds of sugar. It's what? six it's pounds of sugar. Stores, it's, less <laughs> it's less sugar. It's, it's absolutely. It's, it's more grainy. It's more crunchy, and it's absolutely horrible. It has no taste, and they love it. They love it, but it's horrible. <laughs> How is it? What is it? Milky Way. Oh, the Milky Way. 
Milky Way. Yum. Can I take that out to have it uh, packaged? Sure. sure. You need one? Mm. It shouldn't be eating ice cream. That's not ice cream. That's not ice cream. I use, I, I make coconut milk ices, but that's not an ice cream. If it doesn't have dairy, it's not ice cream. Right, Jeff? Correct. Yes, yes, correct. All right, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. What speed do you extract at? Full. Mmm, that is awfully good. Now I just ate some ice cream, which I shouldn't have. So I'm gonna cheat and just increase my pump. And if my doctor's watching, don't watch. When you get into the ice cream business, one of the best things you can do in the ice cream and ices business, if you have, and, and you'll find this out when you get, all get a little bit older, when you have to go see a doctor and they tell everybody your appointment's for 3.30 and uh, bring War and Peace to read because he makes all the appointments for 3.30, all 20 of, you, 20 of you in the office, you walk in with ice cream. You walk in with spoons and cups and you've got the ice cream. And a little extra thing, what I've learned to do, is hold on to that ice cream. When the nurse says, oh, I'll take it to the doctor. No, I'll take it to the doctor. Oh, and by the way, it's melting. That way, you get in to see the doctor first. That doctor's in a very happy mood because he and all his uh, assistants are sitting there eating ice cream. And the heck with that war and peace and four hours of waiting, you just got through. That, I, had, I lost an eye a few years ago, and I went to a specialist in New York City, and he only saw exotic cases and I used to get in to see Dr. Odell, boom, like that, you know, because I'd bring ice cream. And then one day, I brought ice cream, and I sat, and I sat, and I sat, probably for about three hours. And so finally I get in, and I say, hey, Dr. Odell, what's the story here? I've been waiting for three and a half hours. I brought ice cream. He said, yeah, well, the lady before you brought brownies, and I wasn't hungry. <laughs> so still get there first. But it's a great way to, uh, you know, Donald Trump says be nice to your bankers because nobody else is, and that's, that's good business advice. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to bring some free ice cream or Italian ice to your uh, branch bank and give it to the branch manager once in a while, uh, too. Uh, then they'll give you one half of 1% interest instead of one quarter of 1% on your CD. Um, I'm going to make some uh, sorbet now, a raspberry wine sorbet. Um, and this is such an easy formula, it's all twos. It's two pounds of sugar, two bottles of red wine, uh, two uh, bottles filled up again of, excuse me, water, and then three bags of the uh, raspberries. And this is something that is fantastic uh, to sell to uh, restaurants, excuse me, country clubs, or just a party for Excuse me, for your own friends. Sounds like I've been hitting the uh, stuff. Um, it's, it's a very simple product. It's very light, very refreshing. You can do a lot of variations on it. Is it getting too cold in here? Yeah. Ah, okay. When I saw you all breaking out, you know, blankets that you stole from the airlines, I, I knew it was getting a little cold. Um, so it's a, it's a great... Uh, uh, product and you can do variations. You can use uh, uh, white wine and grapes. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I want to make a non-alcoholic version of it uh, with the non-alcoholic wines and some fruit in there. Uh, in its sweetest sense, you could make uh, sangria. What do you need, Connie? On your desk. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so let me get this put together, and I'll use this tub. So I'm going to start with the two bottles of 
wine because, and you can use any dry red wine. I sometimes call this Bordeaux wine sorbet, but don't use Bordeaux. Because when you mix it all in sugar and water, the nuances are not going to be there. Everybody, this is Paula Thompson, my office manager and wife. And uh, anytime you have a problem or question, don't call me, ask for Paula. <laughs> what do you need? No, I put them all out that I had. Okay, two bottles of wine, two bottles of water. Hmm? I know, but uh, the alcohol will kill anything. <laughs> okay, two pounds of sugar. And again, um, sugar dissolves very nicely in cold liquid. And I'm going to pour that into the machine. That's good. Gate's closed. And I emphasize the gate closed because invariably one day you're going to be pouring product in and it's going all over the floor, all over the machine, and your first thought is expletive deleted Steve Thompson because he builds a machine that leaks. And it's only after you pour about half the product in then you all of a sudden go, oh, I left the gate open. You know, so I, this is from experience. I do it all the time. Jeff doesn't, but I do. Okay, now I've got my raspberries. I'm going to turn this on. I think it's going to spurt a little bit because it's pretty full. So maybe I'll start at a slow speed and work up. Yep. It's going to spurt. Let's try a higher speed. Or I'll take some liquid out and pour it back in. There we go. Starting the freezing. One bag. Jeff, last time you were here, you made a um, Pinot Grigio. Yeah. Is that one that you keep in the store yeah. on a regular basis? Is that a big seller? Oh, but people like it? <laughs> oh, okay. You want to tell them how you do that? Okay. It's secret. Everything's in there.
I'm just going to take the speed up to uh, Sorbet. There we go. So everything in there is all natural, no artificial ingredients, no artificial colors. Every, all the color is going to come just from the raspberries themselves. And these are not these are not in sugar or anything else like that. They're defrosted. Uh, under the ingredient listing, it says red raspberries. That's it. Period. So it's a, a nice all-natural product that you can make, and of course you can get a nice high price for it uh, because it is a, a sorbet. No. Uh, the question is, is the shelf adjustable? No, it's set at one height. Now, I made for mine, I made uh, a, uh, another shelf to do pints and quarts to bring so, it up a little. You should market that. We don't want them making pints and quarts with it. Okay. <laughs> the, the reason is, um, and, and people ask about that all the time, can I fill pints and quarts at the machine? I can, Jeff can because we're fast at it, we've been doing it for a long time. But people tend to be very slow about it. They think that they've got to fill it up and then cut it off and cap it. All this time, imagine you're broiling a steak in your oven and medium rare is gonna take 10 minutes. So at 10 minutes, your medium rare steak is ready. In our case, the batch of product. Now, we start taking a slice, we take a knife and we take a slice of steak out. That's our pint. Then we take another slice of steak out, that's our pint. And we keep taking slices of steak out of the oven or pints out of the machine. By the time we get halfway through that steak, that medium rare steak is now charred. It's burned to a crisp because the oven's still hot, the steak is still cooking. The purpose of my batch freezers is to get it out as fast as you can. The other machines on the market, the Italian machines, the Chinese machines, they're very slow to discharge, so your first product weighs much heavier than your last. Now, if you force me to tell you how to fill pints, one way you can do it is you leave the refrigeration on, and whatever size batch you have, you fill half the batch with pints real fast. One, two, three. Worry about cleaning them up and capping them later. Just fill them fast, and then the second half, you can then turn off the refrigeration and take it out into a larger tub. Now you're going to have... Uh, relative consistency. Um, Capigiani once made a head for their machine that they promoted for selling uh, pints and quarts. They had to buy them all back because it didn't work. It's, it's a very simple premise, just like an oven. You leave it in the oven too long, it's going to burn. You leave it in the batch freezer too long, and you're going to have inconsistent air because as you take product out, there's more room in the chamber. So a batch freezer is just what the name implies. It's a batch of product. Make it, get it out, go on to the next one. Uh, they do make, uh, when people want to do large quantities of pints, because pints is a great business uh, in, in many ice cream parlors. People can come in, buy some pints, take them home. Um, Jeff doesn't do that. His, uh, his business is all uh, larger portions and all in-house, so he doesn't need to sell pints. Um, but it is, it is a nice business to have. And if it got really, and you, you do it uh, by manual labor um, while, you're selling, while you're first starting to sell pints. If you get into a huge business of pints, there's a company called TD, Ted David Sawville, S-A-W-V-E-L, and their website is tdsawville.com. Troy Sawville is the president. And they make a really nice package filler for about $7,000 where you make the product, dump it into our large tubs, and then pour it into uh, their package filler, and then you've got a, a pump and a, pre a pressurized pump. You can just put, push the foot pedal and feed through the containers, and it's going to fill pints, quarts, half gallons, whatever you want. And the beauty of it is all the nuts and cookies and candies that are in the machine can go through that pump. Many of them you can't. Your next alternative starts at about $250,000. So you can either spend, you can do it by hand, or you can spend 7000 or you can spend $250,000. Uh, they really don't gear the pint business towards the individual ice cream parlor. Uh, but there's a good example, though, of a, a business doing pints is uh, uh, in Centerville, Massachusetts. That's out on Cape Cod, and it's uh, Four Seas Ice Cream. He is in a resort community. People are out all day long eating ice cream. They also... 
uh, people go up to the Cape and they go every five years and they meet their friends and they have parties together, dinners together. So he's selling uh, you a cone at 11 in the afternoon, and 11 in the morning. He might sell you a cone at two in the afternoon. You come in at four o'clock and buy three or four pints of ice cream for tonight's picnic at your house, and then other people are out at night walking around and they're buying ice cream. So he's selling ice cream all day long, plus getting the, the really good pint business, which is very nice. It's nice to have. This is uh, our accountant, Connie Dominguez. Connie's another voice you might talk to on the phone. You can tell that it's Connie on the phone because she's pleasant. And, and I, I uh, pick up the phone and go, yeah, what do you want? Oh, yeah, good morning, Emery Thompson. <laughs> so but if you get someone nice on the phone, it's either Rebecca or Connie or Paula. That's it? No questions, huh? Connie, do you have any questions? Like, when did you next raise? <laughs> no, that's that, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'm afraid to hear. Thanks. Overrun wouldn't be a factor in it because, like Jeff said, if you've got four ounces of cream and it's just cream or you whip it up to a big mass, it's still four ounces of cream. That was a very good description he gave. So there's, it has nothing to do with alcohol. Uh, you have to talk to your own state and, and see what you want to do. Uh, Jeff's business, uh, his business model and the people that he deals with lends itself very well to what he does. That's why he's so successful. Um, I just finished reading a really fun book. Uh, it was called The uh, Isis Queen of Broom Street, I think it was. And it was about this uh, lady immigrant. She comes over as a child, and she gets into the Italian ice business. It was basically, I called up the author because she was basically mimicking uh, the, the story of Tom Carvel, uh, a very famous person up in New York who did a lot of stores. But her grandson comes along and says, you know what, we got to jazz up this 50-year-old business. Nothing new has ever been done. We got to sell uh, milkshakes that mimic uh, liquor. They won't have liquor in them, but we're going to give them liquor names. And so the first four or five days, boy, business was great. It was something new. Everybody was going crazy. And then the, uh, the group started calling up and saying, I don't like the fact that you're selling liquor to my 14-year-old. And, uh, and, and, and they brought up a good point. They said, this is not the image of the hometown ice cream parlor on average. Um, I did see a funny story, though, there was, or I, I experienced it. There was a place up in uh, Milford, Connecticut uh, 20 years ago. And he wanted to sell liquor ice cream as well as his other ice cream. Well, the liquor ice cream actually costs more, of course, because it's got the liquor in it. And it's usually the kiss of death to have two priceless. You can't have one price at $3.25 and one at $3.95 just because it's got liquor because people come in and say, well, give me a, a, a Bailey's Irish Mist and a, and a, and a, a scoop of uh, vanilla. Well, then they get two different price structures and they say, hey, wait a minute, I thought it was $3.25. So that's one problem. And then the other is what do you do about the parents? Well, he was the first one. He put up a sign that said, adults only. You must be uh, 21 years of age to buy this ice cream. And I said, how's that working out for you? He said, go stand in the corner and watch. So right after school, in comes some 16-year-old, puffs up his chest and says, hi, I'd like to buy the Bailey's Irish Mist. Fine, kid, how old are you? I'm 18, can I see your ID? Oh, it's in the car, I'll be right back, and gone. And then the really funny one, because now I've grown into it, is you'd get the older guys coming in, which I'm getting there, or I may be there now already. Hey, hey, quick. Uh, Get, give me some of that Bailey's Irish cream. My wife's over buying a dress. Hurry up before, before she comes back. <laughs> and that was this guy's clientele. But uh, it's, it's a debatable issue. Are you going to, uh, is it going to fit your market? Always, is it going to fit your market? Or are you going to make uh, some enemies with parents, with children? Because the vast majority of ice cream parlors are catering to children. Um, Jeff's, Jeff's, ice cream, Jeff's business is altogether different, which you'll see 
uh, if you go up there. And you really ought to make the drive. It's not very far. It was about 45 minutes? What? To get to your store? An hour. How long? An hour. An hour. We're getting there. With all the alcohol, I put a large batch in, so I'm at the peak amount that this machine will do. And, of course, with alcohol, it doesn't freeze. It stays in suspension. That's all alcohol will do. Other machines, you can't even put alcohol into them because they don't have enough freezing power. Usually, I do a half batch on this to show people, but uh, my office staff said they wanted some today, so I thought I'd better make a little more. Excuse me? They want the wine. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, well, I'm leaving on a two-day vacation tomorrow, so they can do whatever they want. <laughs> Where are you going? Over to Jupiter. But I carry my phone and my computers. Call them tomorrow. Yeah, everybody else does. It's, it's fine. My idea of vacation is sitting by the pool with a phone and a computer. Because I just love what we do. It's, it's fun. Yeah, it's I know you do. Business. Oh, it's great. It's I wish I had done it 40 years ago. Now, what were you doing then? Were you a t you were a teacher? This isn't the time or place for that. No, you're not telling. <laughs> oh. I know New York State's still looking for him. There's uh, there, there's no. What what is the statute of limitations on that? But really, I found that the most people who come to my class are either in their 20s, mid to late 20s, or in their 40s to 50s, and uh, because either you're you're smart enough to do this as a a career and a profession when you're young, or you're smart enough to realize that this is a way to get out of the other world that you're stuck in and make good money and have your own business. We're ready to watch this. Jack, you want me over here so you can get it on the other camera? Okay, thanks. Here we go. Look at that color. Whoa. That's a you big need batch. some candy corn in there. This is, I didn't hear what he said, but I'm going to let it go. Because I said to myself, I'm going to agree with Jeff on everything today. Uh, it's killing me, but well, you no, I'm only yet. kidding. Jeff, Jeff and I like having different uh, opinions on things because... My customers tell me, and uh, people who write in, they said it gives them a good perspective. Jeff has some views. I have different ones. He's wrong. I'm right. Okay. Come on you up and try this. You have two more to endure. Now, keep in mind, this is alcohol. I'm not responsible. I'm really not responsible at all. I'm totally irresponsible. Nice consistency. Very nice color. Yeah, and that's what I said was you need some candy corn now. <laughs> You're right. What a bomb that was. Hey, I've been there. But it gives me a great story with the shark. Should I bring you some? Doesn't look like you can get up. Okay. When we're finished, uh, Jeff's going to make another product when we're finished. Uh, anybody would like a tour of the factory, I'll be happy to give it to you. You should do that. It's kind of fun to see how uh, an American company builds uh, a made in USA machine. Which you own? Your warranty on machine. One year parts, 90 days labor, and my home phone number, and a guarantee that the machine arrives in perfect condition. It's better than a Georgia guarantee. Which is? If it breaks, you get to keep both pieces. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if you didn't see while Jeff was working, I cleaned it in about five minutes. There's nothing in there. You, I, I showed everybody that the water was clear. There's nothing in there. 
I'm just no. going to take the parts over and wash them in some Maybe. soapy water. A soft ice cream machine takes you an hour. Look at the size of the barrel. It's like this. You can reach in and clean it. Ten minutes. How long did it take you to clean up? At the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a little fanatical, so it That's takes okay. me uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. Not bad for eight hours of work. Or 16. All right, now the time you've been all waiting for. It's Jeff's turn, and I'll get out of here. By the way, uh, since Steve and I are very candid with each other, uh, I'll tell him what I think of this product. Uh-oh. The flavor is very good, but you see what happens when you put fruit in? They become little rocks. And that's what I despise. I never make ice cream with strawberries for that reason, because you wind up with strawberry rocks in it. And the only time I use fruit is when I puree it. I put it in the Ninja, and I puree it to a, a slurry with no pieces in it. And then I add that to the ice cream. But this way, fresh or frozen, you're getting little hard pieces of fruit. And that's what I don't like. And I'll tell you why I did it. Yeah, it's a very good point. He's right. And Malcolm Stogo, who has published a lot of books and teaches a lot, also purees all his fruit so that there are no little rocks in there. Oh, is that so? I'm, I'm not a fan of raspberries. I don't really like them. Because when you bite into them, they have little rocks in them. So I, this is selling to someone who likes raspberries. And so I want to duplicate exactly what a raspberry was like. If I pureed it, it would just be a raspberry-flavored uh, red wine. But with the little, as he calls them, rocks in there, you know it's fresh. Uh, if, if you don't like those little rocks, you're probably not buying raspberries at the supermarket anyway. I well, mean, I pass right by them. I don't like raspberries because of the little rocks. But since I wanted to duplicate what it is in nature, I, uh, exactly, I didn't puree it. So, it's also those seeds so in raspberries particularly, those that's little it. seeds. Yeah, um, unlike a strawberry where you bite into it and they're, they're pretty smooth. Well, but is strawberry, how, you've had ice cream, strawberry ice cream, where it's a, like our ice cube in there, it's a hard piece of strawberry. I don't like that. What you, just no, you're right. What you can do on that, if you ever do want to use fresh strawberries, and good luck finding fresh strawberries. They all taste like cardboard because they come up from not here. Uh, but if you want to, there's a term called sugaring the fruit. You can take the fruit and cut it in half or quarters and lay it out on a cookie sheet put a light, thin coating of sugar, it, sugar over it, called sugar in the fruit, put it in the refrigerator overnight. The, the strawberries will absorb that sugar, and then they won't turn into little marbles. It's a lot of work for something that's not very good, because you just can't get good strawberries anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's See, like finding a, a good stuck in it's like tomato. I mean, I mean, who can find a decent tomato nowadays unless you grow it yourself? Strawberry, you know, I, I'm disappointed with strawberry because you can't get Great strawberries. You can certainly do better buying those bags. I'll get out of the way. Okay. Uh, so for the last thing that I'm going to make, and by the way, I have to apologize on uh, something. The last ice cream I made with the Milky Way bars, I, I forgot to add this much Milky Way bars. Um, so... My bad. It wasn't as, and I, when I tasted it, I said, that's not as flavorful as I thought it would be. It's because I forgot uh, this, which is, uh, this weighs, uh, minus the container, three quarters of an ounce of, uh, um, you know, it's, I mean, uh, seven and a half ounces. It's significant. Anyway. Well, now, uh, just, to, just to make something out of that, if that's what happened at the store, I throw it away. Um, I won't sell that. So I wanted to come up with um, the absolute best, uh, very popular Reese's peanut butter cup ice cream. And it was hard. It was very hard. Uh, it's not in the book because it's relatively new. Luckily, they sell uh, Reese's peanut butter cup um, pieces. I guess that's what they, they don't say what they're called. Hmm? Yeah, but they're not Reese's Pieces. What they are is peanut butter cups that are like, I guess they got caught in the machine or something. I don't know. They figured out a way to market it. Uh, when I started with this, I started buying the cups, the Reese's peanut butter cups and using those. But this certainly makes life easier. However, 
in coming up with a recipe, and that's one thing that we'll spend a lot of time on in the next couple of days, uh, making recipes. How do you make a recipe for ice cream? In making this recipe, um, I found that it lacked. I couldn't get that punch of flavor just adding this to this. So we had to, uh, we had to add some things. Uh, if you think about Reese's peanut butter cups, milk chocolate, uh, peanut butter, and that's it. That, that's all, see, that's all it is. So, uh, so I had to add some stuff to it. So the first thing I added was my go-to ingredient, which is Giardelli chocolate powder. It's crushed chocolate. It's actually just chocolate powder. It's not cocoa. It's chocolate powder. And you can get it. Uh, there's a company called SeriousChai.com. And I, I buy a lot of it. I buy the 25-pound boxes of it. And they're about 100 bucks, but well worth it. You can go to their site now. They have uh, powder and salt. Yeah. I tried going to Giardelli's site, and I couldn't they find... They told me to go to Target. It's cheaper. What? They told me to go to Target. It's cheaper. Yeah. Well, I, in the quantity I need, it's cheaper to go someplace else to get it. That's America. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the first thing I added, was some good uh, crushed chocolate. Uh, and this is one of those six secret ingredients uh, that really changes everything in your ice cream. Uh, the next thing I wanted was more peanut butter taste. So what do you add? You add peanut butter. Uh, and that's basically it. So we're going to add, uh, we're going to use the mix, some vanilla. <laughs> and the answer to why use the vanilla is why not? Uh, the Reese's. The peanut butter and the chocolate, that's it. It's not very complex, but it's certainly more than the last one. And I apologize for the last one, forgetting a significant amount of Milky Way bars. Um, but, oh well. Uh, and do you understand why you throw stuff like that away? You know, it's just, you gotta, you know, you gotta lead with your best shot. And that wasn't my best shot when I made it. You know, if I would make that at the store, that's not your best shot. And my advice to you is, don't worry about it. You know, use the best you can and keep adding more of the best you can and don't worry about it. The, the money will be there. It's, it's just a crazy business that way. The money will be there. So once again, I, at the store, what I would do is I would mix all this together, take out my handy drill gun and mix it together. But I'm, I don't have that, so I'll just let the machine do it once again. Now, the toughest thing to work with is this. Um, this sucks. This stinks. It's, it's awful to work with. Uh, it gums up everything. Make sure that peanut butter is the last thing you make during the day or during your run because inevitably you've got to clean the machine after it. So, uh, so I guess we can start throwing stuff in since we're letting the machine do it. Now, how much is left in here? Five quarts, because we used five on the other one, so that's what we're going to use, so we're good. You'll get used to handling these. It's not as bad as you think. Although I will say that when I was teaching ice cream making, I shouldn't say this. That can only get you in trouble. For some people, it's hard, and uh, I tell them... Just divide it and conquer it. You know, just pour it into pitchers and then pour it into the machine. It's a little easier, I guess. So that's five quarts of that. What we want to do is add lots of chocolate. Do you want the recipe for this? Well, all right. We're going to use um, two pounds of chocolate, of Giardelli chocolate powder. If you want to start talking about expenses, uh, a batch, considering that a batch will be 10 quarts going in, it'll be probably seven gallons coming out. Uh, cost of ingredients run me between 40 and $80 to make a batch. 
That's more than you all do, because uh, you know you'll cheap out in the beginning. Uh, but <laughs> you will. But it, it's a lot of money, uh, you know, that I use to make a batch of ice cream. But you know, it, it is what it is. It's what I choose to do. Okay, so we're going to start the machine running. Somebody asked before why, so that it mixes it instead of. All these ingredients act like sandpaper inside of your machine. So if you, for instance, if you didn't add the mix and just added the dry ingredients, you're sandpapering the inside of your machine. You're wearing down the stainless steel. So I like to start the machine, have it running, have some juice in there, and then add the dry ingredients. Uh, let's go this way, no. Okay, so we'll add uh, the chocolate. And basically, if you think about it, we're only adding to the Reese's peanut butter cups what's in Reese's peanut butter cups. We're adding peanut butter and chocolate to it. You could stop now and have great chocolate ice cream. Some ice cream mix suppliers sell the mix in chocolate instead of just vanilla. This is 10% vanilla. They sell 10% chocolate too. I don't have to clean it. Um, we're adding two, two pounds, ten ounces of Reese's peanut butter cups with half a bag. Uh, I divided it last night. This isn't easy either. Uh, that's why usually I do it in a bucket and use my uh, gun, but I don't have it. So. And this is simply... I mean, you could sit and eat this. Uh, this, is, this is it. This is uh, Reese's peanut butter. I don't have to clean that up either. Reese's peanut butter cups that are mushed up or whatever. Got to speak louder. I got a machine running here. No, they were when I when I got here uh, last night. I froze them. Um, I used to take these frozen and put them in the Ninja, uh, but then I found that I like the pieces better this way in the ice cream. And now the worst part is the peanut butter. Uh, we're going to add 20 ounces of peanut butter, which is one of these jars. Uh, I have a little less, so we'll add a little from the other jar. This sucks, this part.
plus I don't have the normal spate of tools that I work with at my own place. Ugh. I guess a spatula was called for here. That's better. Okay, that'll do. Who said that? See, I knew you wouldn't say that. Let's add some vanilla. How much peanut butter? 20 ounces. So how many ounces of... Uh, five. And that's it. So you got it? Five, five, two pounds, 10 ounces, 20 ounces, and two pounds. And you know when you think about it, when you're making ice cream, what could be bad with this? And look what we put in there. You know, cream, Reese's, peanut butter, and chocolate. Jeez, you can't hardly make a mistake. It's gonna be good. So is it mixed enough to start the refrigeration? I guess so. What was your ingredients? What was my ingredients in this? Reese's peanut butter cups, right. No oh, no. No, that, the Reese's has all the it's sugar. You, yeah. Boy, peanut butter, how good is that? Sit and eat a jar. Does the kid like peanut butter? Oh, she can't have it yet. Why not? How old is she? Your first? That's why she's here. Your third one, I leave her in the hotel room. I don't even know if I'm going to answer that. The question was, can you use creamy or crunchy? Sure. I mean, you can use it out. Uh, you, do, do you have a preference for one or the other? I sure do. <laughs> what would you use? Mm, I would use crunchy. Why? You know, there's a new product on the market. It's called Reese's Peanut Butter Chocolate Spread. Have you seen it? 
you could bathe in that stuff. That is, I mean, that's just insane, that stuff. And uh, I usually add one jar of that, but I don't have it and I forgot it. But we're not going to do it. It's a new thing. I never used to do it. But then when I saw it, I bought it. And the stuff's ridiculous. It's so good, man. What? No, in addition. Just keep throwing stuff in. Just write it down. Huh? Just keep trying stuff. That's all. That's, that's what I mainly try to get across to everybody, that my way isn't the right way. It's my way. Your way is your way. What's your heritage? I'm Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican. So you're going to like a little sweeter ice cream, right? Uh, I use a lot of dulce de leche in my ice creams, uh, which is real sweet also. Uh, but the, the Asian uh, ethnicity doesn't like it so sweet. The Latin does. Uh, so it depends where you open up your store. I'm near a retirement community, and my stuff is so sweet it sends them into convulsions when they leave the store because, you know, they're 80 years old. And they come in, they eat my ice cream, and they freak. You know, it's sweet. I use a lot of sweet ice cream. But it, it's what you like. That's all. And where's the book? It says, make incredible ice cream without buying jugs, cans, or jars of flavoring or colorings. All that stuff over there. And all that stuff over there. But rather, go supermarketing. If you walk up and down the aisles of a supermarket, whether it's a Puerto Rican supermarket, a German supermarket, a West Indian, a, a, an Asian market, you'll find the aisles that have their desserts. And that's what you make ice cream out of. I, I walk down uh, Bravo, you know Bravo supermarkets? It's a Latin, big Latin supermarket. You know Bravo, right? And I'm walking down the aisle looking for new stuff And I see something called horchata. I don't know what horchata is, but it looked interesting. Comes in a, a bottle, maybe half a quart. So people were walking down the aisle. I said, que es esto? What is this? And the guy said, oh, that's all I had to hear. So I bought it. I went back to the store, and I opened it up. And you know what it is? Amazing. It's rice pudding. It's rice pudding. And what they do is they take two spoonfuls in a glass of water and they drink it. Well, when you smell it, it's rice. It's Damn, it's rice pudding. It's exactly rice pudding. Exactly. So I added it to cream and I made rice pudding ice cream. I added some raisins, some golden raisins, because I grew up having raisins in my rice pudding. Did they freeze up on you? Hmm? Did they freeze up on you? No. No, there's a way to not to do that too. I won't have that. But there's a way around that. And, and it became a good seller. Rice pudding ice cream. People still ask me for it. Rice pudding ice cream. Horchata. Now what do you do with horchata? I don't like horchata. Okay, never mind. What do you do with horchata? Drink it. A couple of spoonfuls in a glass. Right. Rice pudding, right? You know what rice pudding is? That's horchata. We gringos call it rice pudding. It's more, it's more of a southern, like American. Rather. Really? It is southern? Horchata is southern? What are you raising your hand for? It's the sugar kicking in. Look at all that. <laughs> By the way, when you, when you go to open up your store, you go to look for a store, if you can, get one with a floor drain. You know, a floor drain. It makes this crap a lot easier. You just hose it off. I don't have a floor drain, uh, but it would make things easier. You know, uh, a friend of mine has a ISIS store, and he has a floor drain. And when it's time to clean up, he just turns on a hose with a, you know, one of those things, and shh. And that's it. It's real easy. But you make do. Um, 
What you'll need when you open a store, you'll absolutely need one of these. You'll need a three bay sink. You'll need a hand sink and you'll need a mop sink. That's it, that's all you need. That's why you can get into this business relatively cheap. Uh, if that machine is 10 grand, you can get in business for 13 grand. You're ready to open your doors, selling ice cream, 13 grand. Where else can you do that? That's pretty good, right? And then, uh, you know, if you're just smart with your money, you just keep expanding and expand. We've expanded six times. Uh, now I have 3,800 square feet and I'm trying to take the next store over. Uh, but we have a stage and a dance floor and, you know, live music, uh, you know, stuff like that. I got, this is the biggest piece of advice I'll give you. Hard to make money selling dessert. Just dessert. Just selling dessert. Hard to make money. You can go to the supermarket and get a half gallon of pretty decent ice cream for three dollars. Three dollars, half gallon. So what's gonna make them get off the couch, stop watching Jeopardy, and come to your store to buy ice cream for six dollars a serving, when they can sit at home and get even Ben and Jerry's four dollars. So what's gonna do that? You know, answer that question and you'll, you'll be all right. I have the answer for it. Speaking of the answer, I keep moving it here, you keep moving it there. Okay, if I only knew the question. The question is, I said to them, it's hard to make money selling a $6 product that the public can go to the store and buy super premium for $3 for a half a gallon. What you were talking about this morning. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard to do that. So, you know, figure out how you get, if you were sitting on the couch watching Wheel of Fortune at night, what's going to make you, instead of saying, hun, hand me that carton of Briars or Ben and Jerry's from the freezer, what's going to make you get off the couch, get in your car, drive to an ice cream place, park your car, get out, and walk into a store and order something that's $6. What's gonna make you do that? And my answer, shock of shocks, will be different from yours. Well, <laughs> it's not great ice cream. I gotta tell you that. It's not great ice cream. Great ice cream is the, the result. It's not, it, that's the destination. It's not the journey. So, Butch knows the answer to that, right? Now you know the answer to that. Didn't take long to see the answer, but now you know the answer. The, why, why are you gonna do that? Six dollars, you can eat all you want. I'll tell you what, but there's a different answer from yours. But my answer is the right one. Mine is too. Part of the answer is because that six dollar ice cream is in comparison to a $10 ticket and a $5 or $6 Coca-Cola and a $7 hot dog. The family of four, two adults and two children, cannot afford to go to the movies anymore. It's too expensive. But they also they can't sure afford help, to go out for ice cream. And they sure can't afford to go to McDonald's because McDonald's gets up to be $25 or $30. You have kids, you have to do something with them on a Friday or Saturday night. You have to entertain them. Entertain them. So you go out to the local homemade ice cream parlor uh, because that's entertainment, and it costs what it costs. Because, it, but it costs a lot less than anyone else. No, they're but not going to. They're not going to get a family of four to come out more than once a month for thirty dollars for ice cream. It's not going to happen. Yeah, well, it's not thirty dollars except your place. The average across the country is three dollars. You're not going to make uh, any the, money selling three dollar ice creams. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I, I have, yeah, I have 36,000 customers, and they're virtually, yeah, they spend the money. A family of four.
Yeah, I can't agree with Steve, you on that Steve, we one. need more bowls. That's all the bowls we have. That's a problem. We had 200. I don't and think you had 200. Six, we did. 25 times 6. That's 150, so we should have another well, 50 bowls. Well, get somewhere. something. Maybe squeeze find. cups if you want. Let me see what I can find. It's the last thing you'll have to taste today. Some of you, anyway. <laughs> How many more bowls? We got spoons. What kind of operation are we running here? We're out of bowls. somewhere and so the idea behind a business is get them to come to your place if I came to visit you in San Diego or if I came to visit you in Chicago or in San Francisco and you're entertaining me you're gonna say hey come on we're going out to uh, my fish house tonight or we're going out to my steakhouse you don't own the steakhouse you take possession of it because it's where you go and it's where you feel comfortable. Oh, and by the way, these? I'm sure you want after your flight get your jacket pressed, your sports jacket, because it looks That's terrible. It? Uh, here, go to my cleaners. Cups. You don't own the dry cleaners. Uh, oh, you want to get some, you pick up some cheese and wine? Yeah, go to go to uh, my specialty store. That's what you want to be in business. Is the place where they go to to spend the money. Uh, there, you don't want them scattering it all over the place. You want to be the attraction. And part of that is to make it a uh, uh, hometown uh, interest to come there. There are other places that, uh, to my gosh, what, what's the name of the, the retirement community? I'm sorry. The Villages. The Villages is probably the biggest retirement community in the United States of America. They have everything you can imagine. Golf, tennis, skiing, uh, bocce ball. Great I mean, ice cream. And everything on earth. But they come to Jeff's place because Jeff, is, his business is unique. It's a destination. That's what you're trying to be in business. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a great, friendly business that people like and an affordable price, uh, they're going to come. Every other retirement community in the United States of America, uh, you're lucky if they'll buy Breyer's ice cream once a week because they're on a fixed income and they're not going to spend the money. Uh, this location is very wealthy people. The houses are beautiful. The whole neighborhood is, is quite expensive. And that they do have the discretionary income to go spend six dollars a cone, but the average price, because I I'm onto every blog there is in the industry. That's my job is to know everything about. It. The average price is three to three twenty-five a cone, and they are making a very good profit. A cone is four ounces, not seven or eight or nine ounces. Uh, it's four ounces, and at that price, they're making money. That's why you're here. You're here to make money. I would, I would conjecture that unless you, except for a specific location like yours, which has got to be the most unique on earth, you couldn't sell a portion that big and charge that much in Rye, New York, where I'm from, or Gross Point, Michigan, or uh, the, the Mission District of San Francisco. Well, that's where we disagree. Yeah, but I've got places like Byright Creamery, who's selling for a three and a quarter, and she's got them around the lines out the corner. Uh, you've got ICI in Brooklyn, lines down the street, but they're selling four ounces at three and a quarter. It's all what we talk about all the time. It's what the market will bear. Your market will bear a much higher sale price, and they want a bigger portion. So it, it is different, but it's not the norm. Look at the mess I made. <laughs> you think? So it looks like we're doing this, right? Uh, we'll have to. Okay. That's, have a that, smaller scoop. Oh no, maybe? that's going to be hard. Yeah, I, I think a small just. Scoop? I think just a large spoon. And let me help you. I got to wash my hands. Sanitize them. Here's a great product to keep around in an ice cream parlor: the hand sanitizer, because you're ending up doing absolutely everything, from mopping floors to adding ingredients. This way, you know, you're always good.
Wow. Well, I guess you're all gonna learn how to eat out of a squeeze cup because that's what we've got left. Boy, that is outstanding. Is it? Oh boy. Tasted. Okay. Chef Jeff says this is fantastic, so come on up and uh, get it. You won't need a spoon, you uh, squeeze it from the bottom. Nope. No. Boy, that's good. Take, yeah, same thing. This one costs a dollar, that one's oh. free. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is the dollar one? Mine. Ah. This is the dollar one. Okay. I would suggest you take these. These are more. They're better. It's really good. So, here's the spoons if you want. Take a bigger one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man, the peanut butter is great. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know it's good stuff. Seven days a week. Thank you. There you go. Here, take this one. No, take that one, Butch. No, not me. Take. Thank you. He'll take it. There you go. Oh Lord. You don't have to eat it all. Now that's deep. Put them on. That's the best thing I've ever made. Really? Well, you've made it before, haven't you? Not here, no. No? The second one? Mm. Here you go. That's very good. Anybody else? Sure, I'm Sorry to hear about that. That's good. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mmm. That's really good. You're not having any? Wow, that's good. If you let it drop, it's not so bad. Mm. that pump up a little more. <laughs> the My goal is to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> what, so you had to do this class alone? Right. Oh, you'll be exhausted. No, I don't want to do this alone. No, me neither. I did that last month. <laughs> That's the best thing that I've made today. This is chocolate peanut butter. Mm. You should take the factory tour that he's going to give. You got it at um, 234. What? 234 here right away. 234? It's what I run everything at. You know why? The machine I have only runs at 234. That's, that's the speed you chose. Correct. Squirrel that away pretty fast. <coughs> you notice the stuff he makes goes in the sink. Stuff I mix gets packaged and put in his personal freezer. Mmm. <coughs> What'd you call it? Chocolate peanut butter chip? No. What What's it, it called? Reese's. Reese's peanut butter cup. 
I used the wrong peanut butter? You didn't use the Reese's peanut butter. <laughs> they don't make peanut butter. <laughs> they do now, or you always did? Wow. Well, everybody knows the best one, Smuckers. Well, my personal favorite is uh, Super Chunk, Skippy Super Chunk. Hard to find it now. Last chance for questions. Then we're done. Thank you very much for coming. Can you open that one up? No, it's dirty. If First you want you to see the it. inside, it's right here. And this that's, one, I would rinse this that's the, five the dasher times for this before one. I opened it because of the food. And still you get gobs of it. It is what it is. Every dasher that goes in our machines is right here. So if anybody would like a tour of the factory, I'll be glad to show you around briefly. And thank you very much for coming. by uh, leaps and bounds and uh, it's really something. We have a big box turtle that lives on the property but I don't see him this morning. It's uh, one of Sadie's uh, best friends. So we'll head inside through the front door and we'll go find Paula.